Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second to last session of the advanced course in biomedical imaging. Uh, this course is organized by the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Coimbra in collaboration with the UTS in Portugal program. Uh, today's session will be in English and in Portuguese. Uh, we'll start off uh, in Portuguese uh, with the session of Professor Bárbara Oliveiros, and then we'll move on to English with Professor Zing in class. My name is Mara, and together with my colleague Adriana, we'll be representing the UT Austin Portugal program and giving technical support to today's session. Uh, in name of the program, I would like to thank all of you for your interest in the course and for attending today's session. Uh, I also take the opportunity to thank our speakers for today, uh, Professor Barbara Oliveiros, Professor Yingding, Professor Elder Oliveira, and Professor Lawrence Court. Uh, thank you for your availability to give today's lecture. I will now give the floor to today's moderators, Professor Maria Filomena Putalho and Professor Francisco Caramel. I wish you all a great session and uh, thank you all. Boa tarde a todos, uh, bem-vindos. Nós agora então vamos iniciar em português. Uh, é um prazer dar a, a fazer a apresentação da professora Bárbara. A professora Bárbara Oliveiros é professora auxiliar da Faculdade de Medicina da Universidade de Coimbra. A professora Bárbara leciona diversas unidades curriculares como estatística, métodos de investigação, data science e inteligência artificial aplicada à medicina em cursos quer pré-graduados, quer pós-graduados. A sua principal área de investigação são modelos matemáticos estocásticos, aplicados à medicina, nomeadamente na área do diagnóstico e prognóstico de doenças crónicas e doenças oncológicas. O Sr. Barber é membro integrado do Center for Innovative Biomedicine and Biotechnology e colabora com o Coimbra Institute for Biomedical Imaging and Translational Research. É ainda membro do Cochrane Portugal, pertencendo ao grupo, ao corpo fundador da mesma e ao núcleo do Centro Associado Coimbra. Hoje vai-nos falar de Artificial Intelligence and Data Extraction in Biomedical Images. Bárbara, muito obrigado por teres aceitado o convite e quando quiseres podes dar início à tua apresentação. Ok, muito obrigada também. Eu agradeço antes de mais à professora Filomeno o convite e ao professor Francisco por estar aqui a moderar esta sessão. E, portanto, agradeço a todos, cumprimento também a todos os estudantes que estão aqui e, e claro, a Mara. E, e basicamente, vou-vos falar um pouquinho de inteligência artificial, machine learning e deep learning. E, a seguir, vou-vos dar alguns exemplos, mostrar como é que se faz um pouco de extração das, das características, das features e a extração da informação com o exemplo de um algoritmo, CNN, e, e vou-vos dar alguns exemplos daquilo que temos feito aqui mais na prática. Portanto, a, a inteligência artificial é, é um ramo da ciência que faz uso de um conjunto de técnicas disponíveis, diferentes áreas, como a estatística, ciências da computação, que precisa de usar grandes capacidades de armazenamento local ou em nuvem e usa também, faz uso da internet das coisas, como wearables e sensores, um, de forma a conseguir realizar tarefas semelhantes àquelas que nós faríamos, mas de uma forma mais rápida e precisa. Há, há imensas áreas na, na inteligência artificial, eu vou-me focar mais na área do machine learning, da aprendizagem automática, uh, a tradução é, é aprendizagem de máquina, que é o que usam é a terminologia brasileira, mas nós em Portugal usamos mais o, a aprendizagem automática. E, no fundo, a ideia subjacente a esta técnica é permitir que, com, com um conjunto de técnicas estatísticas associadas às, à, ao uso de tecnologia informática e, e ao armazenamento de grandes quantidades de dados, que consegui, consigamos... Um, replicar tarefas, uh, tarefas humanas. Uh, eu vou me basear mais hoje na parte da estatística, há uma série de áreas de robótica, etc., usadas na inteligência artificial e também com uso na medicina, mas eu vou, vou aplicar mais o uso da, da estatística, é mais a minha área, e no fundo estas técnicas permitem que nós consigamos fazer a extração de informação a partir de exemplos, exemplos esses que vão alimentar os algoritmos, os, os ditos programas que, que fazemos, 
E basicamente alguemos isso a técnicas que nos permitem visualizar os resultados e aos quais normalmente as quais normalmente estão integradas noutra área que cruza com a, com a inteligência artificial, que é a área do data science. Muitas vezes estas duas áreas são confundidas, porque elas de facto estão, estão muito ligadas. Uh, não será exatamente isso, mas eu diria que na parte do machine learning nós desenvolvemos os programas e depois no data science mostramos as aplicações de uma forma mais agra agradável do que uh, através de código, por exemplo, com aplicações uh, do telemóvel ou, ou para usar em computador ou, noutra, ou de outra forma qualquer. No fundo, a ciência de dados é, é um campo tão, tão grande ou tão vasto como o machine learning integrado na, na inteligência artificial e a ciência de dados é, é um campo que inclui tudo o que está ligado aos dados, desde a limpeza das bases de dados até à, visualiza à visualização final dos resultados, passando por reconhecimentos de padrões, aqui por um, um, um laser, reconhecimentos de padrões, uh, técnicas de, de machine learning, técnicas de data mining, estatística, etc. Um, em termos de, de machine learning, eu, eu vou passar esta parte um bocadinho mais rápida, embora... Uh, primeiro porque começamos a, um pouquinho atrasados e, e depois porque vos quero mostrar os exemplos, mas acho que é importante conseguirem distinguir dentro do machine learning estas três principais técnicas. A aprendizagem supervisionada, onde no fundo está, está direcionada para uma tarefa como por exemplo a previsão ou a classificação de valores ou de categorias a que os sujeitos pertencem, a aprendizagem não supervisionada, que está mais direcionada para os dados, para encontrarmos grupos semelhantes ou, semelhantes ou diferentes uh, de casos, ou então de variáveis, e, e a aprendizagem por reforço, onde normalmente temos um, um interveniente, uh, o dito agente, o chamado agente em, em inteligência artificial, que no fundo vai premiar os sucessos ou penalizar os erros que, que os programas vão, vão desempenhando. Uh, eu, a aprendizagem supervisionada, no fundo, é, é, é comparável àquilo que fazemos quando ensinamos uma criança ou quando ensinamos um aluno numa aula em que estamos a ensinar aquilo que queremos que o aluno aprenda exatamente, dando-lhes exemplos. E, e basicamente vamos treinar o aluno com os exemplos que vamos dando na aula e depois queremos que ele tenha a capacidade de, com exemplos novos, a ser capaz de, de categorizar e de classificar corretamente a, a, o exemplo de onde ele vem. Portanto, o exemplo não será exatamente igual àqueles com que o algoritmo foi treinado, mas a ideia é que ele consiga, o algoritmo consiga reconhecer características comuns e consiga classificar corretamente o, o, o dito novo exemplo. Uh, portanto, se tivermos um conjunto de, de pessoas saudáveis e um conjunto de doentes, o algoritmo vai ser treinado neste âmbito. Obviamente que não podemos depois dar um doente, uma pessoa nova, sem saber se é doente ou saudável, para que ele classifique, problemas éticos podem, podem levantar-se, mas podemos guardar uma parte dos dados que tínhamos da amostragem, como se fossem casos novos, para que depois os algoritmos possam classificar esses novos indivíduos, que afinal já tinham sido recolhidos, e que nós podemos comparar com o rótulo que sabíamos ou que conhecíamos à partida Uh, desses exemplos. Alguns dos classificadores estatísticos que mais aplicamos estão dentro destes três primeiros. E eu, eu separei ligeiramente estes três dos restantes, basicamente porque estes últimos, apesar de, de poderem ser mais robustos ou mais potentes, por vezes, vão precisar de um grande número de indivíduos ou de um grande número de valores para poderem funcionar com alguma robustez, enquanto que estes três primeiros podem ser aplicados em termos de machine learning, mas 
são técnicas estatísticas que funcionam de forma tradicional também e que no fundo são, são bastante úteis a este nível. Basicamente a parte da, da, do machine learning entra, conforme eu vos disse, na replicação ou na repetição dos algoritmos muitas vezes, enquanto são treinados para depois classificarem os casos novos. Mas estes três algoritmos, no fundo, é, nós usamos bastante, bastante vezes. A análise discriminante é, é, é uma das técnicas mais antigas que existe, vem desde, foi desenvolvida nos anos 30 do século passado. Uh, não é tão usada assim porque tem pressupostos muito rígidos acerca da distribuição das variáveis e, e da da forma como as variâncias dos grupos eh, estão próximas ou diferentes da ditomoestasticidade, no fundo, é um algoritmo bastante potente que permite classi fazer classificação binária ou não, em várias categorias, mais do que duas, mas por vezes não é tão utilizada assim por causa da, da falha dos seus pressupostos, que tem implicações um, bastante fortes na correta classificação dos indivíduos. A regressão logística é dos algoritmos que eu mais aplico para classificação binária, uh, porque é um algoritmo que é bastante simples de implementar e para além disso dá-nos um resultado muito palpável, dá-nos um, dá um, uma probabilidade do indivíduo estar classificado num determinado grupo e portanto torna-se bastante simples de, de interpretar. As árvores de decisão, nas quais se inclui, incluem as árvores de classificação, são algoritmos que são também simples de implementar e que no fundo nós conseguimos ter uma estrutura, visualizar as classificações com uma estrutura muito intuitiva para a leitura. Estes outros algoritmos, que eu não vou, não vou estar a descrever cada um deles, há mais do que estes, no fundo precisam de, de um conjunto grande de indivíduos para, para ser aplicado. Nós normalmente usamos uma regra de polegar que nos diz que nunca menos de 5 casos, de preferência 10, idealmente 15, por cada variável independente que estamos a incluir. E neste âmbito, as variáveis independentes são as características que nós vemos dos, dos indivíduos e, e neste âmbito costumamos denominar de features, no fundo, são as características que nós queremos identificar como preditoras ou como tendo capacidade de discriminar grupos. Portanto, estão a ver que se tivermos uma, uma base de dados com, onde queremos considerar, por exemplo, 10 variáveis, nós temos de ter pelo menos 150 casos e isto para ter uma robustez mínima para, para a aplicação. Já agora, aconselho-vos, se quiserem usar técnicas deste tipo, não só de aprendizagem supervisionada, mas não supervisionada também, aconselho-vos que, que podem utilizar este programa, que é, que é bastante simples uh, de utilizar, funciona com widgets que nós ligamos uh, com, com, com traços entre eles para, para obter resultados e, portanto, é bastante simples de aplicar, quer para a aprendizagem, qualquer uma destas técnicas de aprendizagem supervisionada, quer para a aprendizagem não supervisionada, que é uma técnica, ou não é uma técnica, é um conjunto de técnicas, onde nós vamos também tentar separar os indivíduos, mas vamos deixar que os algoritmos tentem encontrar proximidades ou distâncias entre eles, de forma a agrupá-los de acordo com características comuns. Obviamente que alguns vão ser um bocadinho mais diferentes de outros, mas mais próximos de outros grupos, e, e, e o próprio algoritmo vai encontrar regras para, para que, sem supervisão, vá definir estes grupos. Às vezes nós temos alguma dificuldade no final de, do algoritmo classificar os indivíduos e atribuir nomes, enquanto que na aprendizagem não supervisionada, e eu de início já sei exatamente que aqui tenho saudáveis, aqui tenho doentes, aqui tenho maçãs, aqui tenho cupcakes. Na aprendizagem não supervisionada eu não tenho rótulos, tenho os objetos, tenho os indivíduos, e o algoritmo vai funcionar e vai tentar separá-los o mais corretamente possível. Nem sempre temos esta separação clara, mas a ideia da sua aplicação é precisamente essa. 
Alguns dos métodos vulgarmente usados estão aqui descritos, por exemplo, a análise de clusters é, é uma das técnicas mais usadas quando nós queremos juntar grupos de indivíduos, enquanto que a PCA ou a análise fatorial são mais usadas para juntar grupos de variáveis. Portanto, há técnicas diferentes consoante aquilo que nós pretendemos, mas também no Orange podem fazer uso destas técnicas com, com uma grande capacidade de visualização, de, de obter resultados uh, visualmente agradáveis para, para interpretar. No fundo, basicamente usamos quase sempre um daqueles dois métodos, mas temos também a aprendizagem por reforço, que partilha algumas características com os métodos de aprendizagem supervisionado, uma vez que as ferramentas de partida estão dadas ao algoritmo, à criança, ao aluno, uh, são dados de forma a que esta aprenda, mas que depois tenha a capacidade de tomar decisões por si própria e que possa, uh, possa entretanto, alcançar um resultado numa dada tarefa, mas em determinados momentos há a intervenção de um agente que vai premiar ou penalizar alguma das ações e, portanto, é, é, um, é algo mais complexo de aplicar uh, no dia-a-dia. -dia. Entre todas estas técnicas e indo um pouco mais fundo, Podemos, então, ter uma área específica do Machine Learning, o Deep Learning. No fundo, é, é um subconjunto desta grande área e que é composto por algoritmos eh, que se autotreinam, de certa forma. Eh, no fundo, é com o Deep Learning que, que nós temos aquelas aplicações que, que muitos de vós conhecem e que usam desempenham tarefas como uh, reconhecimento de imagem, reconhecimento de fala, uh, e, e muitas vezes, para quem não está ainda a ver bem o que é o Deep Learning, provavelmente já ouviram falar de, de redes neuronais, que, que no fundo uh, é, é a principal técnica que, que é usada com, em Deep Learning. No, não são... Não são sinónimos, mas são quase sinónimos. A grande vantagem do, do, das redes neuronais e do deep learning é que com a utilização destas, a identificação dos padrões e a classificação é feita quase em simultâneo. Ela não é bem em simultâneo, ela é feita iterativamente, sequencialmente. No fundo nós temos os nós, os neurónios, cada cada um destes pontos, destes círculos, é um dos nós da rede, no fundo a replicar os nossos neurónios, são ativados aqui por, por cada, propagando o sinal aqui de forma forward ou backwards, de, propagando para a frente ou de forma inversa, e o algoritmo vai simultaneamente... Uh, classificando e, e, e avaliando os erros e, e, e melhorando a sua capacidade de, de predição. Este tipo de algoritmos é, é usado em, em tradução, por exemplo, todos vós usam o Google Tradutor ou, ou, ou o DeepL, que traduz um pouco melhor, até porque nos vai dando sugestões de alteração a todos os momentos. Há outro tipo de de aplicações que para alunos deste nível pode ser interessante ver como aqui o, o Journal Finder onde nós podemos eh, de certa forma pesquisar onde publicar um artigo que, 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 tenhamos, que tenhamos acabado de escrever acabado de escrever não porque normalmente vamos escrevendo de acordo com a revista onde queremos publicar mas podemos uh, ver, colocar aqui um, um abstract, por exemplo. Vou aqui tirar, fui buscar um exemplo que tinha aqui gravado. E, por exemplo, pondo aqui o título e, e o abstract, eu posso uh, pesquisar em que revista é que vou querer 
publicar, ele dá-me aqui, penso que estarão a ver, não, uh, uh, os 39, as 39 revistas que melhor fazem o matching com, com o nosso artigo, de acordo com, com o abstract, uh, claro que temos os custos associados, queremos se calhar revistas com, que, que demorem menos tempo até à primeira decisão e portanto ele vai filtrando esta não queremos revistas com fator de impacto zero, portanto vamos enganei-me, queremos aqui com maior fator de impacto vamos tirar aqui estes mais baixos, bem não estou podemos ir filtrando e no fundo agora temos só duas revistas que fazem um matching do nosso paper, podemos tentar na Lancet, se calhar não é muito fácil, mas no fundo são alguns exemplos que utilizam redes neuronais. Eu não vos vou mostrar todos estes exemplos, mas por exemplo aqui o Fotomat é algo que foi desenvolvido em 2016 e é uma aplicação muito útil, funciona no telemóvel, onde nós podemos tirar uma fotografia, uma equação matemática ou, ou, ou uma expressão matemática. Aqui tenho a expressão que mostra a área sobre a curva deste gráfico. No fundo, isto é o integral de 0 a 15 daquela equação. Tirei a fotografia com o telemóvel e ele resolve o problema, dando indicações passo a passo uh, de de sugestões e, e de dicas para explicar a resolução do problema até chegar à solução final. E no final pode mesmo uh, dar-me uh, uh, resoluções gráficas. E depois, ao nível da música, há aqui uma série de aplicações onde podemos, eu não vou mostrar agora porque o tempo está curto, mas podemos ir ao volante de um carro, ouvir música por uma cidade qualquer da Europa, basta selecionar aquela que, que pretendemos, ok? Claro que falar disto tudo este ano uh, implica que eu tenho de falar dos chat GPT, nós costumamos dizer que temos o AC e o DC, e, e o chat GPT no fundo vai fazer uso destas técnicas de uma forma muito mais robusta e, e penso que todos aqui que não será necessário fazer grandes apresentações. Todos aqui sabem como é que funciona o chat GPT, inclusivamente eu posso pedir-lhe perguntas, pedir-lhes respostas, embora seja necessário terem algum cuidado, porque nem sempre a, a, as respostas estão 100% corretas. Eu costumo dizer aos alunos que podem usar o chat GPT para estudar, pedindo-lhe para fazer perguntas, pedindo-lhe para responder a essas perguntas e depois confrontam os, as, as respostas com a, com a informação que têm dos livros, das aulas e, e conseguem criticamente avaliar se ele acertou ou não e ao mesmo tempo estão a estudar, ok? Uh, claro que eticamente devem citar o chat GPT sempre, sempre que o usam e, portanto, podem perguntar a ele próprio como é que o devem citar e no estilo que, que vos é exigido para os vossos trabalhos. Ora, nós com a utilização do Deep Learning, porque é que nós não usamos sempre, ou porque é que não usamos, porque é que usamos muitas vezes Machine Learning clássico, basicamente, porque muitas vezes nós temos problemas mais simples para resolver, temos poucas, poucos dados em, em utilização e, portanto, a utilização de Deep Learning com modelos mais, mais avançados não traz assim tantos benefícios se nós não tivermos uma grande quantidade de dados, se não tivermos Big Data. Basicamente, com modelos tradicionais de inteligência artificial, nós a partir de determinado momento não ganhamos tanto assim e vamos sim tirar, uh, tirar uso ou tirar vantagem na performance de, de grandes redes neuronais quando temos muitos, muitos dados. E atenção que Big Data não, não é só ter muitos dados, nós costumamos falar dos três Vs, devemos ter velocidade, variedade e volume. Ok? Em termos de redes neuronais, existem muitos tipos 
uh, ou existem alguns tipos. Um, uma rede do tipo feed forward é uma rede muito rápida, a propagação do sinal uh, de forma reversa é usada na fase de treino apenas e, portanto, aqui é, pode ser mais lenta, mas depois na fase de teste, na fase de validação, é extremamente rápida e é usada em visão computacional e reconhecimento de texto ou de fala. Uma rede radial basis function é, é mais usada em sistemas de restauro, por exemplo, quando há uma avaria e temos de rastrear para trás onde é que foi, onde é que veio a avaria, qual foi a causa. E este tipo de redes é, é usado nesse, nesses, nesses rastreios. Um, as redes uh, deste tipo uh, projetam-se para reduzir, são usadas para reduzir dimensionalidade de, de problemas, como se fosse uma, uma rede neuronal de, de análise discriminante e é, e é usada para detecção de padrões em dados médicos mas não muita imagem médica. Em imagem médica são mais usados outros tipos de redes, como as CNNs. Uh, na rede recorrente, nós vamos guardando em cada camada, em cada layer, o output para ele ser usado numa previsão futura. Uh, isto é mais aplicado ao nível dos drones, por exemplo, que se lembram do último local que sobrevoaram. E, e, portanto, é mais aplicada, por exemplo, nos carros, no carro da Google, que circula quase sozinho, e na conversão de texto speech também. Uh, em reconhecimento facial é mais, mais usual usar redes modulares. Uh, eu costumo comparar isto a um, a um brainstorming de, de redes neuronais. E, e a imagem médica, o mais, uso, o mais usual é, é usar CNNs, redes, redes neuronais convolucionais. Uh, ora, como é que isto funciona? Uh, isto é só, só uma parte, se quiserem uh, pesquisar acerca de, da diversidade de redes neuronais, existe este zoo, uh, que vos pode mostrar, mas basicamente as redes as CNNs... Uh, Usam, usam, estes algoritmos foram desenhados para processamento de imagem, de certa forma, e para detecção de objetos, e usam convoluções. Convoluções em matemáticas são operadores lineares que, que reduzem, que, que basicamente se traduzem num processo de filtragem, de aplicações de filtros numa imagem, para avaliar cada elemento da imagem separadamente. No final, basta a junção de tudo. Okay. Por exemplo, imaginem que tem o número 9, desenhado desta forma, desenhado à mão, e basicamente eu quero que o computador reconheça que esta imagem é um 9. Uh, o que é que vamos fazer? Vamos desenhar uma região de interesse aqui à volta do 9 e podemos uh, olhar para o número desta forma, dividindo a região de interesse em pixels. Estes pixels vão ser representados numericamente, por exemplo, uh, posso representá-los, aqui tenho 9 a preto e branco, podia representar de 0 a 255 usando o sistema RGB com três cores, uh, posso usar outro sistema, agora para simplificar vou usar só menos uns e uns, basicamente menos um quando não tenho tinta, e um quando tem tinta, quando tem a presença de um pixel escuro. E o computador vai olhar para a imagem desta forma. Vai, não vai ver os cantos redondos, vai ver os pixels quadradinhos aqui. E basicamente eu vou ter algo deste género. Então o que é que vai ser necessário? O que é que a rede neuronal vai fazer? Vai criar filtros. Uh, vai criar filtros que de acordo com a orientação da, dos pixels mais escuros ou de acordo com os padrões que vai, vai ver na imagem. Claro que eu podia, uh, neste caso vou criar estes três filtros, tenho aqui um padrão circular, tenho aqui este padrão vertical, neste, desculpem, tenho o padrão vertical aqui com os menos uns e, e uns, Estou aqui a ir buscar o laser. Este padrão circular, padrão vertical e este oblíquo. Claro que eu consigo melhor resolução se eu tiver mais padrões, mas em termos computacionais posso estar a aumentar muito uh, uh, 
a necessidade de mais velocidade e o aumento da capacidade de computação vai aumentar brutalmente e, portanto, pode não compensar, em termos de ganho de resolução, ter assim tantos mais filtros. O que é que vai ser feito? Eu, eu costumo comparar, uh, eu, provavelmente já, já não se lembrarão disso, mas, mas antigamente, numa primeira versão de, de correção, de escolhas múltiplas era, era passada uma folha com uns buraquinhos, um cartão com os buraquinhos vazios, vazios na resposta correta. E, portanto, esse, isso varra a imagem toda e aqui é mais ou menos isso que vai ser feito. Eu tenho o um padrão circular, este padrão circular que vou ajustar neste canto e vou varrer a, a imagem toda, ele vai se deslocar ao longo de toda a imagem para eu a varrer e para obter um mapa de características ou um feature map uh, para este padrão circular. Neste caso, o que é que eu estou a fazer? Como é que, de onde é que vem este menos 0,11? Basicamente é a média do produto do, aqui dos valores do pixel pelo padrão. Os valores de cada um destes quadradinhos pelo padrão. Portanto, se fizerem menos 1 vezes 1, mais 1 vezes 1, mais 1 vezes 1, somarem isto tudo dividirem por 9 o número de pixels que eu aqui tenho. Isto é um exemplo muito simplista, mas depois podemos replicá-lo para, para imagens mais, para exemplos mais complicados. Começamos sempre do simples para o complicado. Basicamente, eu faço o produto da, das células correspondentes, somo esses produtos, divido por 9 pelo número de pixels e tenho este valor. E esta, este filtro com este padrão circular vai varrer a imagem toda. E basicamente eu vou chegar ao final e tenho este feature map, onde tenho ali este 1, o valor máximo ali. Tenho valores são maiores, mais pequenos, independentemente do sinal, mas onde eu tenho o valor mais próximo de 1, corresponde aos nós ou aos neurónios que vão ser ativados mais frequentemente por um sinal e vão passar o sinal às camadas seguintes. Obviamente que eu faço isto os filtros que vão detectar, uh, uh, no fundo, os filtros que eu vou usar vão detectar estes padrões. Se tivermos outros números, podemos usar os mesmos filtros e eles vão detectar os padrões noutros locais. Estão a ver aqui o 8, vai detectar os padrões aqui em cima e aqui em baixo. Aqui o 96, eu vou ter aqui os, estes pontos de 1 e isto são os tais mapas de características e, 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 e basicamente são as operações de convolução que eu estou a fazer. Uh, o processo é semelhante qualquer que, que seja qualquer que seja esse valor. Os próprios filtros, eu posso ter filtros 3D, claro que quando eu estou a aumentar a complexidade do problema, eu eu estou a aumentar a velocidade de computação, não é? E a, a velocidade não, estou a aumentar a capacidade que preciso ter para a computação. Quanto mais complexo for o problema, mais difícil ou mais lenta é a sua resolução. Após a aplicação de diferentes filtros, e aqui tinha só um 9, tinha só números a preto e branco, mas se eu tiver uma imagem eu vou ter de aplicar diferentes filtros, vou ter um filtro para detectar olhos, vou ter, por exemplo, nesta imagem do koala, vou ter um filtro que vai detectar olhos, outro narizes, outro filtro para orelhas, outro filtro para mãos, para pernas, etc. E basicamente vamos aplicando operações convolucionais que depois nos vão permitir reconstruir uma cabeça, reconstruir um corpo e com algumas operações de alisamento chegar ao final e e ver se, de certa forma, acertamos aqui na, na classificação. Será que nós, depois de extrairmos as fixtures, conseguimos classificar bem? Basicamente é isso que se pretende. Tá bem? Para isso, temos os filtros, mas os filtros são absolutamente necessários, mas não são suficientes para, para ter o, o CNN, o algoritmo, a funcionar. Precisamos mais duas componentes, a função da ativação, e o que eu vos mostro aqui é a função da ativação ReLU, que, é, que é uma função muito simples, que basicamente, depois de eu extrair o mapa de features, 
de acordo com a operação que vos mostrei há pouco, eu vou transformar tudo o que é negativo em zero. De acordo com isto, todos os valores que são negativos passam a zero e os restantes passam a ser iguais ao próprio. É, é, é uma função linear, é y igual a x aqui nesta parte e zero na parte negativa. E eu vou ficar com, com este mapa desta forma. Ok? Há outras funções de ativação, esta é uma muito simples, existem muitas outras e a função sigmoide é uma que é bastante usada, podem uh, pesquisar, há outras funções mais complicadas que se calhar vão, vão conseguir ter melhor resolução, mas aquela é bastante simples e bastante fácil de usar. E basicamente, depois da função de ativação, o que nós vamos fazer é fazer o pooling da informação extraída por filtros o pooling das, dos feature maps, com, depois de passar a função, uh, para reduzir o tamanho e a necessidade de computação. O que é que vamos fazer aqui? Aqui vou-vos dar o exemplo de um filtro onde vou escolher o máximo de cada série de dois quadrados 2x2. Dois dois. Portanto, se eu pegar aqui nestes quatro uh, pixels, o máximo aqui é 1, um, é o que vai aparecer ali. Passo ao seguinte e o máximo ali é também 1. Um. E vou replicando o processo até chegar ao final. E, portanto, passo a ter este mapa, este feature map, bastante menos complexo do que este inicial. Portanto, só para recapitular, obtivemos o feature map por multiplicação, fazendo a média uh, da aplicação do filtro à identificação dos pixels mais escuros ou mais claros. Foi passada a função de ativação e depois fizemos o pooling usando a função máximo uh, com passos de 1, um, ou seja, ando de 1 um em 1. Um. Mas eu, há, outros, há outro tipo de, de funções de ativação e de pooling que pode ser feito, uh, como por exemplo, estou aqui a ver usando, por exemplo... O máximo também, mas com passos de 1, um, em que eu basicamente aqui tenho estes dois, é 1, um, ali também, mas depois aqui já não vai ser, já vou ter o valor de 0,11. Eu vou andando com passos de 1, um, mas já vou ter pullings de 2 por 1. Um. Posso usar a função média e, portanto, os valores serão diferentes, ok? Agora, o utilizador uh, vai definir o tipo de de função de ativação, o tipo de pooling que vai usar para chegar à, à solução final. Basicamente, qual é a grande vantagem de usar CNNs e, e, e técnicas de convolução? É que nós com o pooling conseguimos eh, reduzir a dimensão do mapa e, portanto, a memória necessária de computação também. Reduzimos o overfitting também, o, o sobreajustamento, o hiperajustamento dos resultados aos parâmetros iniciais. O, o overfitting, ou o acertarmos demais, é sempre um, um problema, é sempre algo que nós desconfiamos. E, por outro lado, o pooling permite também tornar o modelo mais tolerante a variações de posições. Eu, eu se tiver, por exemplo, uh, se o meu 9, em vez de estar assim, estivesse mais deitado ou, ou estivesse mais distorcido, uh, tornava-se mais complicado por vezes fazer essa identificação, uh, mas o C, porque o CNN não lida muito bem com rotações e alterações de espessura, mas se nós dermos muitos exemplos, basicamente este tipo de modelos funciona bem se nós tivermos muitos exemplos e tivermos pré-identificado uh, uh, quase todas as situações possíveis. Se nós não lhe dermos exemplos de imagens rodadas ou de imagens uh, uh, desta forma, conforme eu desenhei, ele nunca vai ser capaz de os detectar. Portanto, isto funciona desta forma. Só para poderem ver, vou-vos mostrar aqui este vídeo. Last summer, my family and I visited Russia. Even though none of us could read Russian, We did not have any trouble in figuring our way out, all thanks to Google's real-time translation of Russian boards into English. This is just one of the several applications of neural networks. Neural networks form the base of deep learning, a subfield of machine learning 
where the algorithms are inspired by the structure of the human brain. Neural networks take in data, train themselves to recognize the patterns in this data, and then predict the outputs for a new set of similar data. Let's understand how this is done. Let's construct a neural network that differentiates between a square, circle, and triangle. Neural networks are made up of layers of neurons. These neurons are the core processing units of the network. First, we have the input layer, which receives the input. The output layer predicts our final output. In between exist the hidden layers, which perform most of the computations required by our network. Here's an image of a circle. This image is composed of 28 by 28 pixels, which make up for 784 pixels. Each pixel is fed as input to each neuron of the first layer. Neurons of one layer are connected to neurons of the next layer through channels. Each of these channels is assigned a numerical value, known as weight. The inputs are multiplied to the corresponding weights, and their sum is sent as input to the neurons in the hidden layer. Each of these neurons is associated with a numerical value called the bias, which is then added to the input sum. This value is then passed through a threshold function called the activation function. The result of the activation function determines if the particular neuron will get activated or not. An activated neuron transmits data to the neurons of the next layer over the channels. In this manner, the data is propagated through the network. This is called forward propagation. In the output layer, the neuron with the highest value fires and determines the output. The values are basically a probability. For example, here, our neuron associated with square has the highest probability. Hence, that's the output predicted by the neural network. Of course, just by a look at it, we know our neural network has made a wrong prediction. But how does the network figure this out? Note that our network is yet to be trained. During this training process, along with the input, our network also has the output fed to it. The predicted output is compared against the actual output to realize the error in prediction. The magnitude of the error indicates how wrong we are, and the sign suggests if our predicted values are higher or lower than expected. The arrows here give an indication of the direction and magnitude of change to reduce the error. This information is then transferred backward through our network. This is known as backpropagation. Now, based on this information, the weights are adjusted. This cycle of forward propagation and back propagation is iteratively performed with multiple inputs. This process continues until our weights are assigned such that the network can predict the shapes correctly in most of the cases. This brings our training process to an end. You might wonder how long this training process takes. Honestly, neural networks may take hours or even months to train, but time is a reasonable trade-off when compared to its scope. Basicamente, aqui conseguimos conseguiram ver um resumo uh, de como isto funciona, de como as redes neuronais funcionam, os CNNs, e, e que depois são aplicados na uh, imagem médica, como por exemplo para a identificação de lesões. Imaginem aqui esta primeira imagem onde nós Nós podemos ver um, um raio X autórax e, e, de certa forma, uh, pode ser difícil identificar algumas lesões. Aqui a ideia é identificar o pneumotórax. Na, na segunda imagem um, de TAC pode ser mais fácil confirmar, mas aqui, nesta terceira imagem, que é o raio X associado à, à, à inteligência artificial, associado a... a a uma CNN, isto que aqui mal se vê, uh, usando aqui também data science, uh, com uma escala de cores, uma escala térmica de, de temperatura, uma escala de temperatura, é possível criar o heatmap e, e visualizar de uma forma muito mais rápida uh, a lesão. Isto é aplicável a outros tipos de lesões, a detecção de hemorragias, doença como Alzheimer, pedras nas pinta, etc. E na parte oncológica também. Uh, vejam aqui como, com, até para mim, pode ser fácil de, 
identificar lesões só através do esquema de, de cores. Outras aplicações incluem ainda a, a, a determinação do suporte de cálcio nas coronárias, é aplicável também nas, nas mamografias, segmentação ventricular, PET, etc. E nós temos alguns exemplos uh, que usamos aqui no dia a dia, onde podemos ver, por exemplo, aqui um, a, a utilização do, do deep learning na, na ressonância magnética, detecção de câncer da próstata, onde conseguimos uma redução de 70%, quase no tempo de aquisição das imagens, o que é bastante bom, quer em termos de rentabilidade do processo, quer para o doente também, ou para a pessoa que está a fazer a ressonância, uh, 70% de, tempo, de redução do tempo dentro da ressonância é, é, é muito, é um ganho muito grande, para além de que se ganha muito é também em termos de, de avaliação da qualidade das imagens e da compiscuidade das lesões. Isto é só um exemplo, eu tenho outros exemplos que vos posso mostrar, mas eu comecei já um bocadinho atrasada e, portanto, se calhar, uh, para não atrasar muito uh, a tarde toda, se calhar vou ficar por aqui, uh, com, onde nós podemos ver uh, alguns exemplos do ganho da aplicação de, de técnicas de inteligência artificial para diagnóstico, e para prognóstico, neste exemplo, aqui era cancro coloretal, para identificar, separar grupos com melhor ou pior prognóstico e, portanto, aplicar diferentes tratamentos, indo um pouco ao encontro daquilo que queremos para a medicina da precisão. Mas, muito, provavelmente, vou acabar por aqui para, para, não, para não alargar muito a tarde. Eventualmente, tem alguma questão que queiram que possam querer colocar. Obrigado, Bárbara, uh, e, e obrigado por, por teres interrompido assim de forma mais abrupta uh, para que o horário se cumpra. Uh, tu tiveste a oportunidade de estar a falar sobre redes neuronais na tua, na, e foste, foste indicando uh, também algumas vantagens e desvantagens. Uh, na tua opinião, as redes neuronais não são mais usadas na, na medicina por alguma razão em específico? Não, eu, eu diria que são muito usadas para... Mas nós não vemos tanto assim. Nós vemos já o resultado final uh, quando, quando um doente faz um exame, faz uma ressonância, faz uh, dentro do... Isto é uma linguagem não muito, não muito correta, mas dentro da máquina está o algoritmo a funcionar e, e, e o, o médico ou, ou quem está a interpretar a, a imagem já vê os resultados da rede neuronal a funcionar. Okay. Nós na nossa prática aqui mais de, de gabinete uh, usamos outro tipo de técnicas, eu pelo menos estou mais ligada a diagnóstico e prognóstico e não tanto ao desenvolvimento de, de software para, para imagem médica. Okay. Um, e um, estas redes neuronais, elas são muito ávidas de poder de computação, não é? Pois, e... e precisam de grande capacidade de computação e precisam de, de muitos exemplos, muito mais exemplos do que aquilo que nós temos diariamente, do que aquilo que nos vai chegando dia a dia. E por isso muitas vezes fazemos uso ou recorremos de outras técnicas, uma, uma regressão logística, como árvores de classificação, que, que estão, no fundo acabam por ser mais robustas com a quantidade de dados que lidamos Normalmente, a imagem, nós temos muitos, muitos dados, porque cada pixel tem, tem uma imagem pequenina, tem muita informação, não é? Portanto, uma fotografia deste ecrã que eu aqui tenho à frente, são milhares, milhões de dados de informação, não? é diferente do que aquilo que temos quando trabalhamos com, com os resultados que, as, que o software que usa as redes neuronais já nos dá. Uh... Sim, entretanto, tu, é, há uma questão, não sei se consegues ver. Uh, 
relativamente à imagem, falou-se mais de classificação e extração de dados, mas relativamente à reconstrução de imagem, qual o futuro? Eu diria que, que uh, está -se... eu não falei de reconstrução de imagem, acho que há aqui pessoas mais aptas a isso do que eu, mas uh, eu diria que está -se sempre em pleno desenvolvimento e que a reconstrução evoluiu imenso já, mas que ainda continua nesse sentido de, de, de melhorar e de melhorar principalmente com o movimento ou quando há movimento. Mário, resta-me agradecer novamente a tua participação, entretanto o Ivandro também com aqui outra questão. Muito obrigado pela excelente apresentação. Obrigada também pela participação. Não Vou sei se queres responder. Não, não sei se queres responder antes de, de finalizarmos. As imagens médicas com, com o itmap final podem ser em tempo quase real, não, não é exatamente real, mas, mas naquelas específicas que eu mostrei eu fui buscá-las, não, não são minhas, portanto não sei, não sei responder a, a esta pergunta. Não sei se aquelas imagens médicas específicas foram obtidas em tempo real ou não. É, então vamos, vamos fechar a, a sessão, vamos, vamos então continuar, vamos para, para a, a próxima sessão. Próxima sessão, como a Mara tinha dito, já vai ser em inglês. Uh, I'm going to switch to English now. Um, good afternoon and thank you for attending the today's sessions of the online advanced course on biomedical imaging. Uh, we are honored to have with us the presence of Professor Ying Ding, highly regarded research and educator in the fields of AI, semantic web, and data-driven science, who teaches the University of Texas at Austin. Professor Ding's contributions to these domains are truly remarkable, as evidenced by her extensive publication record, active participation in conference, and significant editorial roles. Today, she will be sharing with us our insights on a particularly compelling topic, the diagnostics of chest X-rays. I kindly request your attentions during Professor Ding's presentation, and I encourage you to save any questions you may have for the end of our talk. Professor Dings, we are delighted to have you here, um, and the virtual stage is now yours. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, so today I'm going to present um, the medical diagnosis, um, especially in chest X-ray, uh, the classification, localization, and the interpretation. So I want to start with, um, you know, uh, uh, AI in healthcare. This is the term is no longer new, and especially with ChatGPT recently released, there's a lot of application already applied in healthcare to reduce, the, especially from uh, document uh, generation, different medical notes generation to reduce the uh, burnout of doctors. You can see this is the landscape of all these startup company. Uh, they're, uh, you know, they're role in different area of AI in healthcare, uh, ranging from patient facing telehealth um, and doctor facing, and also uh, research, uh, including drug discovery. So. Um, It's very interesting. There's a lot of uh, auto GPT and chat GPT research going on in uh, to mimic a uh, human machine uh, reasoning in fall drug discovery. Um, but all these things I, I want to say is uh, all this, um, you know, um, uh, AI automation actually, um, you know, uh, in healthcare, we definitely need uh, like all this. Um, We need a human attitude and care and empathy and the mutual understanding between doctor and the patient and those many of them and cannot be automated uh, using AI. So here I want to share share this uh, um, uh, example in the medical uh, uh, imaging. So radiologist is the major person uh, read all these uh, um, uh, images uh, and make a diagnosis. When AI jump in and then AI start to either uh, you know assist the radiologist 
um, or um, actually go into scan many images. You you can see we are uh, we have a crisis in this direction. You can see the number of uh, you know just chest X ray. Of course, there's MI and many other medical images. Two billion chest X ray will be down each year worldwide. And in the US, uh, we have 800 million medical scans a year. This is actually pre-pandemic. This is from the book uh, read, uh, called The Deep Medicine. It's a great book, I highly recommend, uh, by Eric Topol. And uh, currently in the United States, um, uh, we only have like, um, um, we, uh, so each, um, um, uh, each uh, ideologist can only read like 20,000 image a year. Um, roughly 50 to 100 per day. Um, the number can increase in with the facility uh, help from AI. Um, we have approximately uh, 34,000 radiologists. You can see, you make the math and uh, uh, mathematics calculation, you know, how many, how many scans cannot even be timely read, read by a uh, radiologist. So we definitely need help uh, from, um, um, from the AI. Um, and furthermore, actually, um, for American radiologists, thirty-one percent of them have all kinds of at least one male practice claim uh, sued by the patient. So there's uh, all these different problems. And I, uh, I think in this group, you all, uh, you know, very familiar with how radiologists, um, you know, read this scan. And the most important, because this, um, this is a school of training. Um, for radiologists, so first when they look at a, uh, a scan, they first will do the detection. They will first detection to figure out what are the potential significant um, areas that have a potential risk. So they look at, they, they narrow down this area. Then uh, they, they analyze this area uh, and, and, and you know, uh, whether it's a, a pathologic and they um, uh, they dive even deeper on to look at lesion and the different uh, type, and then they want to then they finally make uh, make a diagnosis, and and this error of the radiologist scanning image is thirty three percent for the last seven decades. It's very stable. And what they do is after they sit in the dark room and read the five uh, fifty to one hundred uh, image per day. Uh, you can think about the environment and the fatigue, especially after lunch. Um, it's it's a hard job. And what they generate is this kind of a diagnosis report. We, uh, we call medical notes, a radiology report, uh, which has indication, finding, and imp uh, impression. So um, as actually back to 2017, uh, AI already started to look at, uh, you know, different things about, uh, uh, especially medical imaging. It's the first AI pickup, pickup, um, uh, for for healthcare, I apologize for this overlap of this uh, text. I because I just try to change the format to the slides format. So basically, uh, if uh, so, the, uh, the 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 slogan, uh, the the tweets actually by uh, by Kurt uh, uh, Langlotz, uh, who is director of the AI in healthcare and image at Stanford, he said, radiologists who use AI will replace radiologists who don't. So it's not like. AI will replace radiologists. Actually, is a a group of radiologists will replace another group of uh, radiologists, and this can be actually extend uh, right now. Like um, you know, um, the AI now recently has a historical breakthrough of ChatGPT, and there's even more things going on and a lot faster. And uh, you can see actually for so human and. Um, Normally, human error is 5%, but for radiologists actually keep on 33% constantly. And uh, the algorithm um, before like 2010 actually um, has errors of 30%. Now, actually after 2015, the error to drop to below 5%. So you can see the, the high chance, the, 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 the AI is actually ready to apply in, in healthcare, especially for radiologists. So I, I mean, we, nowadays, when you ask to give a talk, uh, you have to have a slide talk about the chat GPT, right? Uh, so basically, I, I ask chat GPT how chat GPT can assist radiologists um, to do the diagnosis. So this is what he, uh, chat GPT answered. Provide general medical knowledge and answering questions, especially those related to uh, literature, because chat GPT can scan 32 million PubMed articles quickly. Literature reveal, right? 
second opinions uh, and educational tools and uh, workflow optimizations. Uh, yes, uh, uh, generate a structured report and extract the rele relevant information from patient records. So this sounds very promising. Of course, when we apply ChatGPT uh, to AI healthcare, we ha also have to think about the regulation, the patient privacy, and so on and so forth. Um, so AI also make mistakes. So you see, this is the, uh, the, uh, the retina scan and uh, it just add a little uh, noise, uh, adversarial noise, and uh, the decision of the AI algorithm completely changed. So this is a healthy eye a retina, just add a little, it's, it's still the healthy eye retina, but you add little noise, it becomes the, the algorithm actually think it's a diabetic uh, uh, retino, retinopathy. Uh, so this is, a, it's actually with 100% uh, confidence. So you can see AI is not perfect. It has uh, different issues. So what is the best way nowadays? We face, uh, we are facing so many dramatic change recent couple of months. So the, the, the way, so we have a human, we have AI. Is that AI and human work together or they replace each other? So this um, this is the, 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 the actually the test. Uh, did on the uh, using AI um, based uh, tools called the AI Red Companion, provided by Simmons uh, Healthcare, and uh, they actually uh, did the experiment um, um, for 100 uh, chest X-ray image and asked uh, nine uh, radiologists from Germany and the United States to do the two session. Uh, one is with AI and uh, help. Um, you know this too. One is doing the diagnosis without AI help. So you can see uh, this result is, has a very, very significant difference. Like a doctor with AI aided uh, support can generate a better accurate uh, diagnosis than those without AI aided, uh, aided uh, support. So human-centered AI is uh, might be the, the approach to go. So when we look at the radiologist, um, um, you know, before we um, take all this uh, um, deep learning algorithm for chest S3 scan, uh, they actually, uh, um, they are actually have their prior knowledge. So their prior knowledge, they're trained to look at, you know, detection, to look at, the, the uh, to detect the area, look at the shape uh, of that area, intensity of that area, and texture of that area. And they actually develop um, a tool called, um, it's, it, this is nothing related to neural network, is uh, this one is called radiomics. So they use this radiomics uh, as the capture of their prior knowledge to facilitate their diagnosis. So this radiomics features uh, centered around shape, intensity, and texture. So these are different uh, features uh, they can uh, uh, extract uh, um, uh, using not uh, using their um, uh, their uh, pre machine learning algorithm to, uh, for instance, like a gray level uh, occurrence matrix uh, called GLCM. They have a wrong length matrix and the size matrix and texture uh, and and fa uh, fractal features, and uh, those are they are. Uh, you know their prior knowledge, um, and uh, we 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 want to think how we can incorporate the prior knowledge of uh, of uh, of radiologists with the deep learning algorithm, and that we can actually improve the uh, um, accuracy of um, current deep learning algorithm. So we are proposing the human centered AI approach. So another uh, for AI, you need a lot of data, right? So they are for the check surgery, and they actually has a, a large open source medical data available. Uh, not uh, here is um, not only check surgery. You have all kinds of data, uh, data set, but uh, you know CT, PET, MRI. You know, for us, we are very uh, we use uh, check surgery A, the check bird. This is from Stanford, and we have uh, also uh, uh, like other check uh, check surgery from. Um, uh, from I, uh, Indiana University and, and so on. So there are lots of available just for check accessory images. Um, and uh, so how to combine this uh, uh, deep learning with uh, the radiomics? So first let's look at what is the radiomics. So radiomics start is uh, uh, very early is um, the mathematical foundation of textual analysis start uh, from 1948. 
and uh, has all kinds of different um, uh, uh, things like, for instance, grid level co-occurrence metrics actually being able to extract in 1973. And furthermore, they actually automate some of the using this uh, radiomics. The, they, they, it's the first application using the texture features to do the medical image analysis. And uh, they also, for instance, in 2014, they be able to decode a uh, tumor phenotype uh, biomarkers using this radiomics uh, approach. And of course, this radiomics uh, is going on uh, even uh, parallel with, uh, with um, machine learning and deep learning algorithm. For instance, they actually extend, uh, they can extend the textual analysis uh, to do a multi-parametric imaging setting. And uh, this uh, this actually there's a pi uh, a Python for radiomics called pi uh, radiomics. Actually, uh, uh, you just run this tool. They can do. They have several steps. They can do image. Uh, so they can extract all these features, like shape features, um, uh, including three D and two D, um, and also um, grid level occurrence uh, metrics and all these uh, features and textual features. And uh, they can, uh, so once uh, the, the flow chart is, uh, once you do uh, the examination, you get these uh, uh, different uh, kinds of image, and then they can uh, uh, do the radiomics to extract shape, intensity, texture, and even filter. And then they, they combine this into machine learning and deep learning to do the predictions. Um, this is the pipeline that how you can cooperate uh, given the, uh, the, the scan, uh, how you can incorporate the radiomics feature with deep learning together and to do the downstream task maybe, uh, most time is disease classification. So uh, so for any given scan, uh, you uh, first like uh, um, radiologists, uh, they need to de uh, detect uh, the area. Once they find abnorm uh, abnormal area, um, they actually can trigger a uh, pi, um, pi uh, radiomics and do all these uh, uh, extractions about the shape, texture, filters. Um, and uh, they um, sometimes they also can combine with uh, uh, radiology report, and then uh, they do some feature engineering uh, to st uh, study the feature uh, uh, codependence correlation and uh, pick up the feature set and build the prediction model. Um, and uh, so uh, this is uh, like a uh, radiomics. And here um, uh, you can use UCN uh, or ResNet or different uh, uh, convolutional neural network and do get embedding of these images and uh, get some uh, yet yeah, uh, like weight that would just uh, like uh, you, the video just uh, show. So they have uh, all this attention score from the uh, either first layer or last layer of uh, the neural network. And this one can play a role to, uh, you know, um, can be the input for next round uh, prediction model, for instance, random forest uh, and SVM, and then you can pre predict disease. So this is uh, roughly the general uh, pipeline, how you incorporate radiomics uh, into, um, into, uh, into a, a check accessory. Uh, the, the thing is uh, in, the, in this challenge, uh, the challenge for AI power check di diagnosis is, uh, the thing is uh, there are many, uh, you know, uh, uh, convolutional neural network uh, has achieved a great success in many uh, image detection uh, tasks, but not much in the medical domain because medical domain recognizing abnormalities in check array requires expert um, uh, background knowledge. And second, it's not like a nature uh, or daily life image about dog and cat and bridge and bike. Check array has a very um, similar background. It's uh, just all the you know chest. And uh, they have, uh, you know, the, the, the nuances is actually in, in indicated in the very subtle um, uh, features. Um, and uh, it, uh, it's, uh, um, so, you, you know, in, in, uh, in um, convolutional neural network and current uh, deep learning in the in image part, they use all these uh, different uh, uh, distortion uh, to, uh, to, uh, to create a, a data augmentation uh, for positive and negative sampling, so make a, deep learning supervised deep learning. But the problem, this kind of data augmentation is not possible in medical domain because when you tweak, uh, distort the image, you actually, the whole thing might change uh, because there are some diseases just very, very, uh, you see this uh, disease location is very, very subtle. If you just add some noise, 
uh, add some distortion or change color. Actually, they're just gray color. This will complete uh, generate uh, new issues. So we cannot use this kind of traditional data augmentation to uh, work on the machine uh, deep learning for um, for check accessory. Um, more like uh, in healthcare, the major problem we have a data imbalance problem. So we have interclass in variance because, for instance, uh, just for people with uh, infiltration and people maybe have different prime uh, prime uh, prime condition. They, they uh, the, you know in, in your just in the same class you have different variations. And for the intra class variation, you have a data imbalance problem. For instance, there's a lot of your data. Even you have this a disease of lung disease, but you have uh, maybe lots of patient in pneumonia, but very few. In, in in like infusion or mass or, or noodle, right? So those are challenges that we are facing uh, for applying traditional uh, um, uh, deep learning into um, medical imaging. Um, so what we did, um, this is one of the research uh, we did is, um, so we, we use contrastive learning. So contrastive learning uh, actually is a supervised deep learning. So basically, um, the idea is uh, you um, for each image uh, you use data augmentation to pick up uh, one positive uh, example, um, and uh, uh, um, the rest. If you in the batch, the rest of the image we think they are negative. So the the idea is you can generate the contrastive loss to make sure that uh, your uh, focal image has uh, most similar uh, similarity with the positive sample and the further uh, further uh, distance or dissimilar dissimilar from the negative samples that's what we talked about before uh, is any data augmentation method used before in contrast learning for um, other images won't work for here you cannot uh, distort you cannot add a uh, noise so what we hear uh, to um, we build a new um uh, uh, sampling uh, uh, contrast uh, data augmentation method here is actually try to incorporate the prior knowledge of uh, radiologists, uh, which is we call radiomics. So we actually use an uh, image and its own radiomics, uh, its own radiomics uh, uh, embedding as uh, their positive sample, and all a, all the other uh, 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 the, for next negative sampling. We want we actually carefully choose images, not just uh, any other image besides this focal image. We actually based on this chessboard. So the chessboard is an ontology. Uh, um, um, it's it's a very small ontology. It's how it's actually uh, it classify these um, different lung diseases according to the organ organs. So for instance, some lung diseases are uh, are related. Uh, Close to heart for the uh, for instance uh, cardiomegaly um, uh, is close to its enlarged heart, uh, but it's a uh, one of the lung disease. And there's many other diseases uh, related to uh, connect to bone, spine, and in the lung disease we have like uh, seven diseases located. So uh, this give out us um, some uh, way to uh, for us to pick up um, the heart negative example. So for instance, uh, we pick them and make sure they're in, actually in different organ or uh, to make sure they are uh, further away, they're very different. So we use this uh, uh, very simple data augmentation, which is uh, radiomics um, as, as a positive sample. And uh, we just do this uh, contrastive loss uh, to trend, um, uh, trend the embedding. And uh, we, uh, the data set is we use an IH check accessory, which has uh, 11, uh, 100,000 uh, X-ray image um, from 30,000 patient. Um, uh, there are, you, you see this is a data imbalance problem because uh, among these uh, uh, this, uh, images, uh, 100, we have 80% um, is actually healthy data. So that means there's no disease at all. We only have 24,000 health disease. So how do you do contrastive learning? So are you contrastive with healthy case or with disease from different disease? So that's all kind of different, interesting way we can figure it out. Um, and also different disease, even among this 24,000 image, we actually have a different uh, uh, number of patients. Uh, we have nine classes. Um, and, uh, um, uh, you know, we have a uh, one no finding means a healthy uh, case, one eight uh, diseases. Uh, among these, tell you, we only have 
900 bounding box generated. So we only have 900 uh, ground truth or annotated data. So you can think about, um, yeah, we have 100,000 image, but we only have less than 1,000 uh, annotated data. So that's a big challenge. That's why we produce, uh, recommend uh, contrastive learning so they can ge self-generate um, uh, uh, a supervised uh, data set to train, uh, train the embedding. So uh, the training strategy anyway, just a very standard 70% uh, uh, of training, 10% 10, 10 for validation and 20% for test. So we did this uh, contrastive learning and we compare with the baseline met method. This is our, our model. So first uh, task is disease classification among these uh, eight diseases. Uh, we can see uh, we uh, most time we achieve uh, high accuracy, but uh, there are some other methods, uh, for instance, like infusion, they have also uh, same kind of accuracy. Uh, but in general, you can see uh, we actually have 1% increase uh, with the mean of accuracy for class uh, classification. Um, and uh, I want to go, uh, the, the, the most interesting thing actually is uh, disease localization. So for lung disease uh, classification, most uh, uh, current state has already achieved pretty good result, but for localization means you have to generate the bounding box um, in the region. So um, it's um, the accuracy is pretty low. Uh, so the way how to measure, to evaluate uh, uh, the bounding box uh, localization is we use IOU. IOU is intersection over union. That means uh, we have ground truth. Remember, we only have a 900 ground truth. Uh, we use ground truth and, uh, and attention score we generate uh, from uh, deep learning. And based on attention score, we draw the box, a bunny box. We compare the overlap between uh, the, the, our bunny box with the ground truth. So the overlap is 0 0.1, uh, is a 0 0.2. Of course, if you have more overlap, 0 0.7, all this uh, accuracy job dramatically. You can see it's dropped significantly. So this is actually a major area. Uh, we can actually innovate and improve. Uh, we did some ablation study uh, to delete, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is uh, this is a contrastive loss, uh, contrastive loss. This is the focal loss. So focal loss is most people use uh, classification, cross entropy loss. And here, if we, without, uh, um, Without uh, uh, contrastive loss, uh, uh, we can see uh, um, uh, th th the accuracy job, right? Jobbed. Uh, and uh, adding the contrastive loss back, the accuracy uh, goes up. Okay. So, this is some example of uh, our bounding box. Uh, so, the red part is a bounding box generated by us. Uh, and the, 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 uh, the yellow uh, box is the ground truth. So you can see there's some overlap and some there are quite some difference. So this is a first attempt. And now um, after this uh, GPT goes out, um, but this is before that, so transformer, uh, we, uh, we use similar uh, idea, but we not only not test on the ResNet. So last research is on testnet. So we actually use the uh, visual transformer. So when once we use the facial transformer, so we use the facial uh, visual transformer for the radiomics, uh, generate radiomics, and same for the uh, the image, and we do the same contrastive loss, uh, and we can we compare uh, visual transformer. Uh, uh, this is a traditional visual transformer. This is RGT is our method, which has um, using visual transformer and plus contrastive learning. And you can see we can achieve a better result uh, in the uh, localization uh, with IOU 0 0.1, 0 0.7, uh, up to 0 0.7. Um, so, um, this is the, if you want to know more detail, this is the paper uh, published in IEEE transaction on medical imaging. And uh, furthermore, we actually think um, there are a lot of, uh, uh, this is a, um, this is the, uh, so there are, um, so one patient not only just had one uh, medical scan, sometimes they have a set of medical scan. The best uh, contrastive uh, uh, learning is to use the patient own scan, the previous own scan as their uh, positive example. And, uh, and the other patient 
scan as their negative neg negative example. So we try to maximize the agreement between uh, between uh, uh, the focal image and the patient previous the same patient previous image. Okay, and in the same disease, and. Uh, to maximize the disagreement, that's precisely what contrastive learning is doing uh, between the focal patient with other patient, uh, they actually also in the same disease. So uh, you can do several different strategy for contrastive learning. You can enforce the heart, uh, the negative in the same disease or enforce the uh, negative in different disease. Um, or yes, uh, so you can do this kind of comparison. Um, uh, we, uh, we again, uh, again, this is a contrastive learning. So basically you have an image going, uh, uh, um, coming and, uh, we, uh, we, we, uh, yes. Uh, so we did just a uh, normal, uh, 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 yes, uh, ResNet, um, uh, to get the embedding. Then we use grand cam. So grand cam is the way it's kind of, a it, it's expandable AI for, uh, imaging. So you can, it's actually get the attention score and uh, to draw the bunny box here. And uh, we compare this, uh, yeah, we use uh, ResNet 50. Uh, we compare this uh, with the contrastive loss. Uh, this, is a, this is a contrastive loss. Uh, we have like positive and negative sample to contrast loss. We also have a cross attribute loss and we combine those loss together uh, with uh, cross attribute loss and contrastive loss together uh, as the total loss, okay. And then we did the same thing um, for uh, disease classification and, uh, um, and uh, also uh, bunny box generation. Uh, so we, uh, you can see we did have uh, made some uh, improvement. So compared to the previous study here, uh, we didn't use radiomics. We just use the patient pry uh, image as the positive sample to do the supervised learning for, uh, for deep learning. So there's some uh, some uh, some uh, disease we can achieve uh, some good uh, result. Um, and uh, I mean, okay. Uh, and we did ablation study uh, to uh, has uh, with or without contrastive loss. Uh, you can see they, they actually have uh, quite a difference with uh, this is with uh, contrastive loss and this is without contrastive loss. And this is uh, some example of our localizations. Um, I mean, um, so and, and uh, deep learning uh, to do the disease classification is important, but also important how you generate uh, the generate uh, bunny box. So um, for for image, uh, a grand cam play a very important role into it. Uh, there are different way of doing the uh, explainability. So this is original uh, image. Just give you example. This is a uh, uh, we we also heard about the. Uh, a back propagation of the, you know, you get a last layer weight, you back propagate uh, to the first layer. And this is a, a CDNC map. Also, you can see the cat and dog. And if you uh, high grand cam, just high cat and they only high cat. Um, and uh, there are some guide to the grand cam. So guide the grand cam is guide the back prop uh, propagation together with grand cam. So you can also see the cat, and this is a, a occlusion uh, map. So this is also different uh, explainability method for the same image. What you can see, some are quite good, but here you know for the cat it's great, and this is a ResNet Grand Cam cat, and, and and so on and so forth. So how we get this into the uh, uh, image uh, for medical image. Uh, so there are different uh, debate. Uh, there are different kinds of, uh, you know, uh, Grand Cam plus plus and uh, guided backward because the debate is um, Grand Cam um, only take the last layer uh, because the last layer of the weight is uh, uh, do the uh, prediction, right? So it's uh, important. So it's output put layer explanation is uh, um, related to the class specification because that's the way to use to do the class classification. But people also think uh, the first layer of neural network is also very important because that's uh, how you get a pixel space uh, from the image that that's the first time they trigger the neuron, right? So then they uh, uh, guide the back 
propagation, they propagate into the first layer, which is input layer expansion, uh, has a pixel space. So what now we use, uh, we combine both, like we combine. So some research said we need to use uh, the first layer is important and it means input layer explanation is important. Some uh, research says output layer explanation is important. So what we did is we combined them together to get a, um, just get a weighted average or element-wise uh, multiplication, uh, get a new weight and use that uh, to do uh, to draw the bunny box. And uh, so yeah, this, uh, this is like uh, the procedure. Like first we have a grand can, then we back propagate, uh, we uh, back propagation. We combine them uh, together uh, to uh, draw this uh, bunny box. Uh, the, the the significance of two and draw the bunny box and compare with this uh, ground truth. So this is uh, some um, experiment we did uh, for uh, for different disease uh, based on IOU. And uh, this uh, this is cross EAI is our method. We some of the uh, disease we uh, can achieve a little better accuracy for bunny box generation. Um, talk about grand camp because grand camp is the major way to uh, draw the bunny box. Uh, there are different kinds of uh, grand camp. Um, basically, like what uh, previous talk says, uh, it's the attention score. So the attention score. Um, uh, you, you know, attention uh, score is some people think a uh, minus uh, weight is not important. So, like a grand can plus plus, they actually uh, uh, they uh, they uh, they only they use relu only pick up the positive grand, uh, gradients. Um, and uh, um, but uh, you know they if you look at the difference of the formula, it's actually grand can plus plus that has a relu here. Um, but th th the thing is. Uh, there are some research. Uh, yes, so this one is talked about before. is a uh, is a guided grand cam. It's a uh, uh, guided back propagation and with grand cam together. This is like what we said before. Uh, they combine because they believe uh, the first layer uh, of uh, pixel space is important, and the uh, weight on the class uh, class uh, space also important. And 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 this way they combine them together. And uh, there are another uh, research done uh, by Johns Hopkins, and they actually uh, talk about high resolution cam because the major problem for grand cam is they tend to pick up large area. So their bunny box is big. Um, you know, they tend to pick up very big area, but most of the ground truths, they are very small apart. So they believe um, Actually, the negative ingredients also it's very important. So they propose the high res uh, can can keep both um, um, positive and negative uh, gradients uh, to draw a bunny box, and they claim they actually can draw a, a better, more narrowed uh, bunny box. Um, and and uh, drawing bun bunny box is kind of explain of AI, and they have like a challenge and opportunities. For instance. This is uh, not check accessory, but this is one image. And this is different way they can uh, draw, uh, uh, find attention and, and uh, draw the bunny box. You know, grand cam is the way. So you can compare grand cam with all the other methods like integrate gradients, uh, guided BP, back propagation, and, uh, uh, and, and also our uh, LRP. They actually, grand cam has a, uh, not very accurate. It's kind of like a pick up a big area and and those things. Second thing, so second, so so there's another research direction how we can improve grand cam to pick up better high resolution um, uh, um, weight uh, area. The second problem is if you add a noise uh, to this image, and actually the algorithm will detect. Uh, actually change the decision. It's not classify this as a dog, but classify as a, a different thing. Of course, this could be the AI algorithm bias, but you see, once they add a different noise and the, the classify, classification already changed, the, the explainability is still exactly the same. So it's a very, it's a kind of dilemma about AI algorithm and explainable AI, how you combine them together because both of them could be wrong. One is wrong, but the other still pick the same thing, and the other is wrong, and uh, even for the same image. So these are all these challenges we are facing. And furthermore, I want to 
briefly say this as um, in Czech X-ray recently, there's a lots of like knowledge graph in Czech X-ray going out. So there is a, is a data set called uh, chest IM genome data set. It's available in, in FusoNet. Uh, it's public available. So they build a knowledge graph um, based on here because for chest, uh, you have an anatomic uh, region for chest when people look at the like upper level lung, lower level lung, and lung uh, close to art and close to spine and close to the bone and so on and so forth. So they use this uh, anatomic region and uh, pick up the uh, uh, combined with radiology report and uh, uh, to, uh, to pick up, uh, uh, so there's uh, create a different nodes. One node uh, is about um, a disease and about locations and attribute of disease. So this is uh, the data set. And second, uh, just like what I said before, we have Chexpert, which is ontology. And also we have uh, uh, eye track data called Reflex. So Reflex is the data, uh, has a 3000 image data. They have eye track. Uh, so all this together can uh, trigger neuro symbolic learning, which is a kind of a, another way of combining uh, human knowledge with uh, machine learning. So uh, deep learning is neural, right? So symbolic is uh, human knowledge. So neuro symbolic learning is the new way to combine them uh, to create a, 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 a better uh, a prediction and localization. So I, my, my talk finished uh, here, uh, and I want to uh, credit to my uh, to, to, to several things at UT. <laughs> so I, this is a AI in health lab uh, at my school, School of Information. And we also work closely with um, the National AI Center uh, at UT, which is called the Institute for Foundation of Machine Learning. So this is uh, um, uh, including student, faculty, and collaborators uh, that we are working on this kind of uh, issues. So that's my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ding, for your nice presentation. Uh, I think we have a, a question. I don't know if you can see in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. Explain more detail the method you use to generate the attention map uh, with pixel importance. Yes. Okay. I can go back to. Um, do you use post hoc uh, training explanation within the architectural model? No. We just use contrastive learning, which is not an uh, uh, explainable AI method. It's just uh, it's a supervised method. Uh, this contrastive learning you can search is being applied in many different areas. So we will just apply this here um, to generate embeddings uh, classifications. And based on the embedding classification, uh, the, the trend uh, neural network. So what we did is uh, we we use GrandCam, that GrandCam I just showed you, which only take uh, the last layer of the neural network. For instance, you have a four layer, four layer of neural network, right? Um, you, you take the last layer of the uh, weight, but exclude, exclude uh, the negative weight. So because they have the ReLU function. So you get, so here you get the weight for each uh, pixel. Um, and you can, uh, you, for negative uh, weight, you just convert into zero, right? So you have this weight. And then we back propagate this weight all the way back to the first layer, the first layer use guided back propagation. And the first layer is just the, the pixel trigger the neuron. Some pixel trigger the neuron, some pixel didn't trigger the neuron. Then uh, for those being triggered the neuron, then they can carry weight propagate into next layer for the, for the way. So this one, uh, we, we uh, capture the input explanation. You just back propagate to the first layer, get all the weight there. This is we call pixel space. And we just did a very simple, just weighted average. You just weight all these pixels. For each, uh, for, for each pixel, you have uh, you have weight uh, from the first layer. You have weight from the last layer. You just uh, get the average. Or we just uh, element-wise uh, 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 multiplication. Uh, so this, this is actually exactly uh, the same like, um, uh, yeah, this is a, a very similar as uh, the guide, the uh, Grand Cam, which is available, uh, code everything is all available. You can you can use right away. And guided the Grand Cam uh, actually uh, being uh, you know applied uh, uh, you know if you look at uh, current research uh, in this area to draw, uh, to draw the bunny box, 
um, uh, guided grand cam play an important role. But still, people, I still, you can see uh, uh, people just only use grand cam or grand cam plus plus, or uh, very few people use guided uh, back uh, propagate. But uh, the combination of grand cam and by, uh, back propagate called guided grand cam is it's it's being used for several studies. Um, thank you. We we have another question. Um, yeah. Uh, just yeah. out of curiosity, are these images submitted to any corrections or filters before entering training? No. This is the original image from uh, from uh, we 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 use an uh, image. Uh, yeah. There's no any corrections um, and the filter uh, being processed for image. Uh, we just take uh, the image from the data set, NIH data set, and mimic a CXR data set. Okay, thank you. I, I have a question about uh, the imbalanced mm -hmm. data. Uh, you mm -hmm. have a severe uh, problem with uh, the imbalanced data, and I, I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you have, uh, how do you address the problem? You just live like that, and the, the classification is done without any try to, to balance the data, or do you? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Resort to uh, any method to 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 solve it. Yeah, that's a very good question. So for data imbalance, from that's why we use contrastive learning. So contrast learning, we suddenly don't have these uh, imbalance issues because we focus on each image. For each image, we have positive sample, one positive sample, and maybe right. twenty negative sample. This twenty negative sample came from same disease. If this disease have a different, uh, very few uh, few patient, uh, you can extend to other disease um, based on this uh, this ontology. Uh, so we have this uh, Chexpert ontology, uh, sorry. Uh, yes, so yeah, we use this uh, Chexpert to pick up um, related disease. For instance, if this disease has a very few patient, we pick up the disease next to, for instance, the edema has a very few patients in the data set. We pick the things connect next to each other, for instance, pneumonia. And from there, we pick up uh, 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 negative samples. So okay. that's, so you use contrastive when you can deal with a data imbalance problem. And the, currently we have several other ways to deal with data imbalance problem. We use a diffusion model like teacher, student, teacher model. So you divide the data sets, the same data set, you divide it into like 20 subset, but each subset has some overlap. Okay. Okay. And then, and then the imbalance is actually spread in different places. Some, some part is, uh, has a, mm, less imbalance problem and some data set has a higher uh, data imbalance problem but you trend you you trend is uh, you you trend this all this into uh, individually uh, use resnet or say trend you get a you get a model then the the student your 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 testing data set the student will learn from this each teachers and aggregate a better model so that can deal with a little uh, data imbalance problem but in general Data imbalance but is a big problem, and we currently had have a research going on. We uh, actually recently just published. It's not related to medical imaging. It's actually uh, about um, uh, cancer. Uh, we call it cancer GPT. So I tell you, actually, the GPT model, the GPT model can deal really well with zero shot and few shot learning. So that can um, be great help for the medical domain. So we uh, use uh, GPT two, GPT three. Uh, and uh, compare with a large language model for Tableau, uh, Tableau large language model. And we uh, do the drug combination for cancer cell line prediction uh, for rare cancer. Uh, so for especially for rare cancer with very few um, uh, example, mm -hmm. like a few, yeah, zero shot learning, few shot learning, uh, uh, this uh, GPT model outperform uh, XGBoost and uh, other things. Thank you so much. I have another question, which is uh, in some way uh, correlated with the other questions about the filters. Uh, in in some fields of the image, we have problems uh, because the 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 image the is not acquired using the same parameters and came different images come from different yes. scanners. I don't know if yes. you have this the same kind of problem in the in the in the chest uh, x-rays and uh, if yeah. you do how do you deal with with it that's that's a, a great 
uh, question. Um, yes, we face the same problem. The the the, the only the data set we uh, the data set we use for instance uh, a mimic uh, CXR they are coming from the WAN uh, ICU so they don't have they. The same okay. scanner, so they don't have any this issue. But for other data set, they collect from a different hospital. That definitely is issue. And this issue, I tried to talk to radiologists, and uh, I uh, in the in the computer science uh, domain, like AI domain, they didn't. Not many people talk about. They assume the data they get is actually it's a it's a good data set, right? It's a yes. it's a yeah, it's consistent. But actually, that assumption is wrong. And they, uh, especially they train this uh, data into deep learning model. Uh, that can generate a lot of bias. I think this is uh, one kind of bias we have to figure out. I don't know the solution, how to deal with this uh, scan coming from different scanner and with different filter and different quality. I, I don't know <laughs> either the solution mm -hmm. and I, I wish to know. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was a wonderful presentation, a, a wonderful time for listening to you. Thank you again. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks. It is my pleasure to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Elder Oliveira. Dr. Elder Oliveira is a senior research at the Ines Tech and a distinguished expert in medical image analysis, computer vision, and data science. He leads the visual computing and machine learning area, uh, coordinates the data science hub, and serves uh, as an invited assistant professor at the University of Oporto. He has a significant publication record, industry collaborations, and academic leadership. Today, he will be enlightening us on the captivating subject of advancing cancer research with computer vision and machine learning. I remind you that there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the conclusions of Dr. Oliveira's presentation. I extend my gratitude to Dr. Oliveira for accepting our invitation. Welcome, Dr. Elder Oliveira. You now have the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your invitation and for your kind words. Uh, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here in this in this workshop. Thank you all for for the attendance to be here. So I will speak a bit on on a topic related with computer vision and machine learning challenges, uh, focus on on cancer research. So this is the the, the main area of research I'm I'm working with. Um, so I'm in my background is from electrical engineering, but since my my PhD that started in, in 2008 and finished in 2013, I, I start working with uh, with machine learning uh, related with with cancer, and then I continue on on that on that field. So uh, my my presentation, so uh, just a brief uh, uh, index of the, the presentation. I will start with some numbers on cancer and, and facts. I will speak about the, the, the challenges on computer vision machine learning, and then I will uh, present some, some results on, on some use cases related to breast cancer and lung cancer. So who I am, so uh, uh, Francisco already told something about me. So my, my, my main job is uh, as a senior researcher at Inesc Tech, so it's an institute uh, uh, in, in, in Porto. Uh, related with, let's say, electrical engineering and, and computer science. So I'm at Inesc Tech. I'm in the center of telecommunication and multimedia, and uh, inside of uh, the CTM, I'm the area manager of visual computing and machine intelligence. I'm also uh, invited professor in, in faculty of yeah science in the department of computer science. Okay, let's let's start the presentation. So in terms of of cancer, so of course all, all we know that. Uh, cancer is uh, as an eye incidence uh, on mortality uh, uh, so it's one of let's say the, the diseases that affects more people in the world so basically the one that affects more is the cardiac ones um, here you see the, the incidence of, of cancer so let's forget the others but the most incident is breast lung and cor colorectal for example uh, but there is a difference on the incidence and the mortality. And for example, you see the, mo the most incidence is breast, 
and then in terms of mortality is not so it decreases a lot so in terms of mortality is the lung okay um, why for example i'm giving this example on, on breast cancer why the, the mortality on breast cancer is very very let's say small in compared with incidence is due to the screening process okay so the the, the screening on 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 cancer on on on, on breast um, is, is, is very important and, and is very effective, okay? So um, in, in Portugal, uh, we have, and so it's similar in other countries, we have three screening processes in terms of cancers, is breast, uh, colorectal, and cervical, cervical cancer. And so, the, and these make a, a, a big difference. As you see, for example, in terms of lung, the mortality is very high, uh, and for example, you see, for example, pancreas that appear here. So pancreas, the incidence of pancreas is not so high, but in terms of mortality, then it appears here uh, because it's a very silent disease, for example, and uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, there is no process of screening and the, the survival after detecting is, 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 uh, is very, very small. So the screening and early detection is very important on cancer and save a, a lot of uh, a lot of lives. Uh, but the, the cancer management is is a very big process, and the thing I'm talking here today, imaging, is uh, let's say a small part of all the process of the research data management. So there is a lot of different tools in different uh, uh, areas. Uh, that should work together in order to 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 create uh, a good environment in order to 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 help physicians researchers in order to, on, on their 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 tasks. Uh, I always like to talk about this the P five cancer medicine. So is uh, this is not from myself. So here the, the publication. Uh, where it came, and but this is very important on cancer. So uh, there are five keywords, very, very, very important. The first one is predictive. Okay, so we should develop uh, technologies and procedures in order to predict the, the appearance of cancer. That this is very important. The other one is personalized. So each patient is its patient. The characteristics of the of the cancer, the characteristics of the persons, the characteristics of the physicians, the characteristics of the treatments, all of them are different. And there is no, no equal patient and no equal procedure. So in, in this area of research, we should be personalized. Uh, we should apply personalized uh, procedures. So it's very important on that. Then is preventive, so the screening, so try to prevent, so try, try to, to, to guess, uh, try to, to be effective on preventing the, the disease. This is also very important. Then the participatory. So this is not a job for physicians, okay? This is a job for all people are involved. And one important person that is very uh, important in this process is the, 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 um, the patient. Okay, as you will see, for example, in breast cancer, I will show something that is very important for, for the patient. So the last decision of the treatments is always the patient. Okay, so the patient should be aware about all the consequences of the, of the, the all the process of, of treating cancer. And so this, this is very important. And then the physiological thing. So nowadays it's, it's okay, see this is a, um, a huge, uh, huge problem, and the consequences of the, having a cancer, the consequences of having a specific treatment, um, are, are um, creates issues on the persons, and this is also a, a very important keyword. On, of course, it's not only for cancer, but it's important for for cancer. Another aspect that I I uh, also want to, to talk on this kind of presentations is the, the, the meaning of a, a digital twin on. So digital twin is being used in different, in different areas. 
and in health it's not different and of course in cancer it's not it's not different let me try to put here the, sorry okay okay now I, I hope you are seeing my my mouse okay so in in the uh, here in the upper row you have what we call the, the traditional routine okay uh, so the the diagnosis diagnosis treatment all the exams that can be done in this kind of uh, in this clinical pathway and in the bottom uh, you have what we call a digital twin okay we have uh, let's say uh, could be an ai an ai platform that runs in parallel with the clinical routine using exactly the same data that is used in the um, in the traditional routine but provided for example additional information for the physicians okay uh, th this could work together providing additional or new informations for the physicians in order to help them to 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 provide some some decisions okay Okay. okay so talking about the the challenge now uh so the first thing is the huge data set so in 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 um in medical data uh, we have uh, we could have plenty of data and and also big size images for example or big size uh, data it, this is a huge problem and that's why you need to to start uh, having uh, solutions uh, on, on, for example, GPU processing in order to, to deal with this. So it's a great effort uh, in order to, to develop some AI algorithms on, on, this, on this field. So this is one of the, the big challenge on, on, on that. Then is the, the, the missing or weak annotation. So having data, Okay, we have some rules in, for example, in GDPR, some that, that could sometimes uh, putting some problems on obtaining data, uh, but it's it's possible to obtain data. So we can find public and, and, and sometimes in some projects we have some private ones, but the big problem, the big problem is the missing of it. It's, it's, it's hard, so the, the, the best models that on AI models works on on uh, annotated or supervised uh, way and it's very hard to have those annotations from from the physicians um, there is some 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 examples so what normal we want is something like this a segmentation from if we have a nodal in the in the link what we want is a segmentation uh, very fine segmentation of of the of the link but this will take lot of time uh, sometimes we have some let's say sparse notation that okay we have a region of interest or sometimes we don't have anything we just say okay in this image there is a nodal we don't know where but there is a nodal okay and this is hard okay so this is hard uh, to obtain and sometimes but sometimes we need we sh we have to work with these let's say weak or non annotated uh, images um, that's why in this specific uh, topic of, on the missing annotations, sometimes we have uh, other networks in order to create some artificial data, in order to in increase the quantity of data to help our models to learn. Um, so models to feeding models, so yeah, that's it. Uh, segmentation, segmentation is always uh, 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 always important on, 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 on this on this field. Uh, sometimes just to identify the region of interest. Okay, so trying to avoid the algorithm to run in all the, the images, segmenting and just look for a specific region. Uh, and sometimes the solution. So the problem is segmenting, and the solution is uh, a drawing in in, in, in the image uh, showing. Uh, uh, some anatomical findings. Um, uh, the problem of segmentation uh, is the generalization. 
as in other other problems because for different institutions for different uh, radiological imaging machines uh, the, the the images produced could be different and generalizing models to run in different with different institutions is is, is quite hard okay uh, we don't want to do models to run in a specific hospital we want to do models that could run with different uh, uh, cohorts and different uh, data sets so that that's it's quite hard Another one is, is registration. Yeah, sometimes we want to have, a, a, let's say, a more holistic or more complete uh, way to observe data. And for that, sometimes we have images of the same anatomical region uh, obtained with different imaging uh, uh, devices. And to obtain, uh, let's say, a complete model, we should we should uh, uh, try to register the, the, the two, the two uh, uh, images modalities, or three or four, OK? Uh, uh, there is some issues, for example, uh, sometimes the patient is not in the same position. And so you have some deformations that you have to deal. Uh, sometimes the, the, the acquisition is not, and mostly is not made in the same, in the same time. So, uh, this could be this could be hard. Sometimes the images are in 3D and other data is in 3D. So um, that, that's that's um, also a, a big challenge on this. Uh, then we have ensemble. Though this is this is also something that uh, uh, we normally deal with. That so uh, combination of different models with the same data in order to provide. Uh, to provide different outputs and combining the outputs. So um, uh, normally we don't know when we don't know which kind of model that works better with our data, we could run different uh, models and obtain different uh, outcomes and then combine that outcomes. And the other is when we have different modalities as we see, for example, here we have imaging, here we have, source, for example, uh, um, information about the, the, the patient and also clinical notation. We can, for example, combine different sources of data uh, in order to, to obtain a, a combined uh, outcome uh, on, on our models. Then the, the data sparsity missing at a normal, normal data. So in, in the field of uh, uh, health, the, the, um, there is a lot of noise on the data. Uh, so with, with be, for example, bad annotations or no annotations, and for example, for the for a specific for a spe specific uh, <coughs> sample uh, or for different samples, we don't have exactly the same information. Imagine this is samples, the visits, and and A, B, C could be the cohorts. Imagine the different hospitals could have uh, different routines. And for the same problem, they could get different kind of data. So this is art for models. So we should deal with this, let's say, missing information. Uh, so uh, uh, in order to deal with these different, uh, let's say, routines uh, on, on the hospitals. Um, and, and the data is very, very sparse. So because of that, um, and then we have the mistakes or, or the, the, missing, the missing ones. So imbalanced data is also uh, a big problem, for example, in breast cancer and in, in most of the cancers. Most of the data that is acquired is non-cancer. Okay? Uh, for example, on screening of uh, breast, breast, um, breast uh, screening, sometimes is the, the, the quantity of non-cancers is more than 90% and the quantity of cancers is less than than 10. Um, and that is a big problem for, for the models. So normals, models normally uh, wanted balanced uh, data sets. Um, and this is, this is a, a big issue. So we need to, to, to deal with that by or changing the data by uh, undersampling or uh, oversampling the data. 
uh, that or we lose data or we are including data that is not real that, okay could be in the same distribution but it's not real other aspects is to train a model to deal with the imbalance so that is uh, another way to do it um, in my view that is what we should do so inform the models how is our population and not trying to to guess new new data or ignore some some data that is very uh, uh, important um, other important aspect is the how the physicians can trust in our models okay they they want to understand how the models deal with the data and why that output that came from a specific model is that or is and is not and that this is very hard uh, because physicians are very logical so they look to the to the exams and say okay this is cancer because this tumor is big or uh, or this tumor is very uh, uh, specular or something like that so um they they want to understand and nowadays for example using deep learning it's very hard to explain so we don't know what is going there so it's a very very bleak, black box so then we have methods that appear like explainable ai that sometimes is uh, on showing on the image regions where the, the model uses it to provide the result, like for example the blues, or the red ones that okay that that is was not that region was not important for the result, so just look for the the blue ones, and that could be an interesting thing. So saying okay, uh, we could inform the physician on the locations that he should look at, for example, trying to help them. Other aspect is when we are not working on the let's say imaging level could be on the on the features level so, so sometimes we have some features and we could try to provide uh, 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 some information about the importance of the, each of the features that uh, are more important or not to provide the result but in here again the features must be understandable by the physician so if you put here like we have here okay if the, by the way this is a, an image from from a paper from us uh, on on the detection of uh, mutation on on lung cancer saying for example the feature ephysema the semantic feature so if it's present or not was the most important feature to provide the outcome or the one so these features that we have here so here for example we have gender are understandable by the, the physicians but for example if you have if we put you extract some let's say high level features from image like a wavelet or other things the physicians will not understand so they will not trust on, on the model okay and finally more than showing some let's say importance on features or uh, important regions is the causality so that result was that because of that and that okay and the causal models is being uh, now used more and more on this on this uh, on this area trying to uh, create a rule to explain the physicians the cause the causal uh, of that out outcome on, on the model okay and that's it so the the final part of the my presentation is the, the use cases so in our in our group cancer is one of the the, the main the main area of research always using computer vision and machine learning. Uh, we work in, in different cancers, so the, mostly the, the more important ones are the, the breast cancer, 
in lung cancer, so those are the, the ones that we will have more uh, projects and, and research running and PhD students. But we also had some, some work on cervical cancer, prostate and colorectal, mostly on pathological ones, on pathological images. We, sh we also work on pancre pancreatic cancer and, and neuroblastoma. It's a pediatric one. And we had a, a lot of collaborations with national and, and international um, uh, organizations, mostly on, 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 on research projects. In terms of uh, breast cancer, so we work on this area for uh, more than 20 years. So it starts maybe in 2002 or something like that. I even was not here yet in Tech. I, I was in my bachelor, so I, I just get in, in at Tech in 2008, but here at uh, Tech we already was, we were working on this, on this field. And, and in breast cancer, we touch different different fields. So it's the, let's say the most important um, area of research. So we work on computational pathology. We work on radiological images. Uh, we did some work on on surgery planning for reconst reconstructive surgery. There's also some surgery planning, but for conser conservative treatments. Uh, we did surgery evaluations on, by the way, the, it, this is the area we started working with. So evaluation the surgery on breast cancer after the surgery. So I will explain a bit more. And we did some work also on the rehabilitation. And th those are the, the, our partners on this field. So in terms of uh, computational pathology, so the, 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 the biggest problem is the, the, the big size of the images. So sometimes it's, uh, 30,000 per 20,000, so it's a very, very big image and it's very hard to, to run models to, to deal with this. And we did some work on detection, segmentation, classification, uh, image quality assessment. This is also very important, right, to detect if the image has quality or not to be analyzed by, the, by a pathologist. Uh, color normalization, so this is something also important, so different uh, institutions could uh, obtain different, say, tonalities on the images. Then this is quite hard on 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 uh, putting models uh, dealing with these uh, these different, let's say, uh, uh, quality images, and also some some domain adaptation. So sometimes it's not so the the difference between image images is okay. So it's pink, red, or something, but sometimes it's harder in terms of uh, of colors and this domain adaptation between different um, uh, uh, perspectives of the same uh, inform of, of similar information of the same tissue uh, is also uh, uh, an interesting area of research. So in radiological images, we the, the focus is obvious more on, on, on screening, screening and detection of findings in, in images. Uh, we, and we work with different, uh, different modalities, starting with x-rays and mammograms, uh, also with uh, MRI data and with uh, ultrasound ones. Okay, so let's see some more interesting results and some more visual uh, interesting results. So in, in terms of, uh, uh, surgery planning on the reconstruction surgery. Um, we have this project. So we imagine uh, when, uh, when uh, a patient perform a mastectomy that is removing all the breast, uh, there is an option to reconstruct the breast with their own tissue. And the, the, let's say the grand truth procedure is based on the uh, uh, extracting tissue from the belly and reconstruct the breast with that, with that tissue. To, 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 to perform to perform the, this, this procedure, the, the, the surgeons must evaluate the vessel network of the, of the belly in order to select the most appropriate region to do the, the transplant. Okay, so the, the, the vessels, so the, let's say the caliber of the vessels in the breast are bigger than let's say the, the normal ones here in the belly. 
and for example selecting the, the most appropriate uh, uh, region with vessels similar to the ones that are there it's very important so this is quite hard to so this is a, an example of a CT of the, of the belly, okay, so this is the skin here, this is the um, intra, uh, the, the subcutaneous part, and here is the, the, the muscles ones. So the, the vessels are these white things here, okay, in the, the subcutaneous region, it's okay, some, let's say, let's say, uh, not so hard to obtain because it's white in the, in a black thing, but here in the subcutaneous is a white and a gray thing, so it could be harder. So, and what we did was to try to develop a semi-automatic tool to detect the, the, the vessels. Okay, you see there already our algorithm running and detection of the vessels in the two regions. And the final one is obtaining a 3D perspective of the vessel network on the on the um, on, on the belly so this is our new software that we have and then the, out, the outcome is something like that so, so it's a report that goes for the for the physicians you you have what they call perforators so it's we have eight perforators more or less uh, considering the umbilicus in the middle you have four to the right and four to the left and then for each of the perforator, you could have a caliber, uh, the coordinator, so 27 right, 28 up, considering the umbilicus in, in, as a center. And then the, the, the coordinates in the fascia, that is this region here that separates the subcutaneous with the intramuscular, and the, the length of the of the vessel and based on this information the physician is able to select the more most important region to to use it for that and then so the outcome could be something like that uh, on on surgery planning on conservative treatments uh, the idea is so the conservative treatment different from the other one is just removing the tumor and it maintains the most uh, the most uh, part of the breast. And why this is important? This is important because I normally play a bit on on the words that I'm going to say. By the way, it's a lie. But I normally say that the the breast cancer don't kill. Okay. Of course, this is not true. But that, as you saw. In the, in, in the graphs as I present in the first slide, the survival rate is very high. And most of the women that have breast cancer will die in another disease, okay? So they will live a lot of time with the consequences of the treatment of the breast. So, and the surgery on the breast could affect uh, very high uh, the women, in terms of aesthetic. That's why there are some procedures that are very important procedures on that. And the aesthetic is, the, the, is, is, is important to deal. And to the, to, the, to the patient, so as I said, the, the final decision is uh, for the, the patient. So the, the, um, the patient must be informed very clearly about the consequences of the treatment. So the tools that we develop here are mainly to help the communication between the clinician and the patient, but also the, could be for training, okay? And could be for the, the physicians on when are uh, deciding. So in this specific project, we used uh, two sources of, two sources of, uh, of data. So the outside that is, for example, a scanner of the skin of the, of the, um, of the patient. So it's a 3D model of, of the patient. We have some anatomical uh, findings. Then we have the information of the interior part with the radiological images. Let's focus on, let's say, a position of the tumor. 
And then what we can do is the combination between the two sources of data to have a more complete model. You can see the tumor inside and physician could, could see that. So we can, for example, then try to simulate the extraction of the, of the tumor by this cylinder, the position in the skin, where is that, where is that tumor? Uh, and then we can try to simulate uh, the extraction of the tumor and the results in terms of aesthetic results. Okay. In this kind of surgery, the, the, uh, the, by the way, we are not expert on graphics, just on machine learning. Okay, so maybe this is not so beautiful. It's a prototype. Um, but the, the, so as you said, you, you saw the most, uh, let's say, the, 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 uh, the, the remo removal of the tumor, it will affect on the retraction of the breast. So that is, let's say, the, the minimal that, that happens. And this is also very important. So we can show to the, to the, to the patient a possible result on the, on the results. So uh, again, we, we also have, so in surgery evaluation, try to evaluate the surgery. So this is something that the physicians do normally. So they evaluate the, 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 the aesthetic of the patients after the surgery. So they consider, for example, after one year, all the process of cicatrization is done. And then uh, what they, they did in the long past ago was, okay, they compared, let's say you consider this uh, the, the healthy breast and these the, the ones that were operated. And they could, for example, compare the two breasts, assuming that the operated one was similar to that one. And they do an evaluation uh, using a scale of, uh, of four or four levels. But what we did was again trying to imitate them, and we create a software to to do that. By the way, this is a free software that is being used for more than 300 uh, hospitals in in the world, in order to help them to have at least an objective uh, way to do that. And then on the rehabilitation, okay, so. Most of the patients that uh, are making a, a breast, breast cancer surgery, they are affected in the upper limb, the ones that did on, on the side of the, the breast that was operated. Uh, most of them uh, have the lymphatic um, system um, affected and they need to do rehabilitation. This is a chronic disease, they, they need to do rehabilitation uh, in order to the, the arm is not going to be affected. So uh, what we tried to do here was to create like a, a kind of serious games uh, helping that you can imagine to put running this at home with exercises that are normally performed in, in the hospitals. Here we have a robot, here we have a, a person. So sometimes it appears that my, my student and we did this with a Microsoft Kinect. And here is the, 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 the movement of, of the, the person in real time. And this is the robot that the person should uh, imitate. And then in the end, we could have some uh, statistics about if the movement was done correctly or not. And then the, this could be sent by, to the physician. Okay, what next on this area? And, and what next is something that we are doing right now in, in, a, in a specific project uh, is imagine those models to, on creating the vessel networks or creating uh, models on 3D to see the tumor inside and simulating. Uh, imagine you can have a, a, a room, a, a surgical room, with some augmented reality, and then those models could be projected in the patient. And then you can see inside uh, before the surgery. Uh, you can see the, the tumor on the person. Uh, you can see the vessel network in the belly uh, in cooperation what we have right now that is showing in a, in a screen in a 3D environment uh, here we are going to do is to project that on, on the patient. Okay, 
in lung cancer. So in lung cancer, we focus our research mo mostly on uh, findings on something that normally the physicians don't see. Uh, what I want to say with this is uh, to detect if it's cancer or not, it's more or less easy to a physician on lung cancer to see some uh, CT images and say, okay, this is probably cancer, this is not. But for example, for type of cancer and mutation information, that's, that must be done with the, with the biopsy. So you, you extract a piece of tissue of the tumor and then you analyze that um, in a pathological uh, institute. So uh, this is what they normally do. They do a biopsy. Okay, They try to understand the status of the gene. Uh, they, they decide about the treatment. If they do chemotherapy, radiotherapy. Okay. These are the traditional ones. And then we have what they call the new ones, though the the TKI that is the the a very special treatments for specific mutation and the, a, a immunotherapy. So this what they call target therapies. Okay, and there are some studies with with some drugs for specific mutations. So those are the mutations that are present for 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 lung cancer. Uh, the most present is KRAS, but then we have, for example, EGFR. There, are, there are already some, some, let's say, some pills that patient can take it and to treat uh, the, the the lung cancer. And so this is very important. You need to characterize early and and very well the mutation status because if some specific mutation is present, you can attack to a specific drug. Okay. Uh, so the ones that the only ones that are approved is for this one. Uh, there are others that are being being uh, worked with. So this is the the current pipeline. You have the images. You have the clinical data. Uh, you can say that is lung cancer. Uh, if you if you uh, uh, um, are expecting that is lung cancer, you do a biopsy, you detect the genes. Uh, and so what, what we are trying to do is to replace that. Let me show you. So it's the replacing that by looking to the images. So it's impossible for a physician to detect the mutations on the, on the images. And what we are trying to do, and this is basically the, the most of the work we are doing in, in lung cancer is to look to the images and try to identify the, the presence or not of a specific mutation. And that's it. So we are trying to innovate on traditional CADs to, let's say, to more comprehensive CADs. Uh, and, uh, and by the way, I'm not saying in the, uh, we will replace the biopsy. It's not what I'm saying. So the biopsy, should be used, of course, and should be in the, it will be used uh, always uh, because uh, with imaging, for sure, you will not have uh, uh, better results with that. But what we are trying to sell is uh, w when a, when a, a physician decides to a patient that it must be for perform biopsy is when the the physician understand that is really cancer or he has some doubts because if uh, there is no doubts there is non-cancer they will not perform a biopsy okay so biopsy could kill the patient and uh, and it's a very intrusive procedure so the idea is of course when when a report came from a radiological department to the pneumologist saying possible cancer could have also a report saying possible mutation A, B, C. Okay, and that cannot be performed by the physician, but can be performed by a, a, an algorithm. Of course, then after 
physician will perform a biopsy. But then you will have some information saying, okay, with a probability of something, it's EGFR or it's KRAS. Okay, that's it. And this is a big step. Okay. Uh, yeah, so trying to go a bit uh, fast because maybe we don't have too much time. So we did some work on, on cancer, non cancer. Uh, detection. Uh, we did uh, a lot of work on lung segmentation, so this is very important. So we should focus the the analysis on lungs. So we should um, um, segment the the lung. But as I said, uh, having different data sets, having different cohorts data sets is is hard to deal. So we did uh, a lot of work on that, trying to use different data sets and with the same model. Uh, in order to obtain a, a very good results, okay. So, for example, here we train with two data sets and then we test with other or other four. So, this is trying to put realism on the things. Then there are other findings other than the mutations, that is the presence of FSM and other other things that are also very important. And some of them are related with being cancer or not, or being mutation or not. So. Uh, then, as I present in the in the, the challenges, is the synthetic uh, creating synthetic data to improve our, our 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 methods, and we did some work on 2D, so trying to uh, have artificial data using let's say you see slices, and if you consider the slices as uh, 2D images. Uh, uh, but you don't have, imagine you, 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 you generate some artificial slices, but they are not, uh, let's say, uh, related one with the others. Then we pass this for 3D using a, uh, and as you see, then the models uh, run, and that's a big issue. So with a, let's say a quarter of resolution to guess or to generate 300 images, it took 17 days in a GPU card. So it's, it's methods that takes a lot. And then EGFR mutation, that is the, the ones that, so we, we, we try to evaluate what are the most important regions to detect the EGFR. If it's only the tumor, if it's the lungs, okay, we did some work on that, trying to, to find what has the best region of interest on, on for this specific area. Uh, since we have uh, not too much data, we try to have some uh, some supervised methodologies. And also we also support some example that combining data from imaging and but also from from clinical data. And then uh, to understand the results, we also did some work on uh, explaining the results using uh, some methods on, on the feature ones, and but also on, on explainable AI. And then what next? So uh, what next is a, a never ending, uh, never ending uh, uh, methodology to deal with multiple sources of data from imaging to, to electronic health records, uh, trying physicians on giving more information to help them on the diagnosis plan or the treatment plan or the management plan. So, and having a never ending learning process uh, to help physicians on, on, on this. Um, there are other aspects, sorry. There are other aspects other than the imaging uh, and biopsy that is microbioma and uh, Ariana sec that we are also exploring. I don't have to talk too much time here, but this is also some something that will appear um, in the, the near future. And then to wrap up, so this is our, uh, let's say past projects on related with cancer. So all the funded projects that we had mostly from FCT or for national programs, but also from 
European ones and the, the ones that are, are running now. So as you see, we have, for, for example, one that is working with microbioma, someone focused on exponential AI, other ones on generating data, okay, lung and breast, and that's it. So a lot of projects running right now. Okay, so this is my final slide. So my vision is to having a digital twin in the never ending um, models uh, to help physicians at this. And if you have interest on this, so you can contact me. This is our research group at, uh, at Inesc Tech uh, and Center of Telecondition Multimedia. And we are happy to receive you if you want to, to work or collaborate with us. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I was wondering about that um, that algorithm that you show about the the breast um, surgery forecasting. Um, I was wondering uh, what you said that uh, you are you you are using um, artificial intelligence and. Um, what what are you using for training the the, the models okay so uh, you are talking about this one right yes yeah so in in terms of models we so the, the current method it's the uh, it's a random forest by the way so it's a very simple one and we based our algorithm so are you talking about this final thing yeah the guessing yes yes yeah so the grand truth on this is um, biomechanical models so in terms of deforming and simulating things on on 3d and, and uh, is the biomechanical models that took a lot of time to to uh, to run it and they they are very hard and by the, the, the way, I don't understand anything about that. Uh, what we did, we had a, a biomechanical model uh, from the literature and then using some, some data that we have from our partners, namely the Champalima Foundation, we, we train our model based on the simulations provided by biomechanical model, okay? So we had a model that deformed the breast uh, on removing the, 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 the tumor, the, the tumor, and we create a lot of data from biomechanical models, and then we train a machine learning model to imitate that biomechanical model. Okay, so so you are retrieving all, all the training data from simulation. Yeah, it's a simulation of a simulation. <laughs> yes, you, you know why? Because there is not too much data. And it, and it's very hard to do that. So then yeah. we, we need to create, a, 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 let's say, a, a artificial generated data by, with biomechanical ones. That okay, it's the grand truth. So it, they are, let's say, not perfect, but they are very good. And then we run a machine learning on, inside of that. Yes, yes, we do the same things. We we generate synthetic data for some other. Um, fields and train the, 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 the artificial model with that data. Uh, meanwhile, we have two questions. I, I don't know if you have access to the Q&A. Oh, I have it, I have it, yeah. Okay. When, when there is no, no normalization, the data in certain cases that are not labeled and provided by different institutions, different routines in the process. Okay, so uh, there is two questions. So the, uh, maybe I should uh, read, the what it, you read the question. So the question it comes from Evandro Fonseca, and he says, "What is your advice when there is no normalization in the data, and in certain cases there are not labeled and provided by uh, provided by the different institutions?" Okay, there are different things. So in terms of normalization. Normally, the, the, the data that came to us is raw, okay? So the physicians don't worry about 
and the normalization. And then we, we need to, and machine learnings work very bad with, if you don't normalize the data, uh, you should try to, to, to normalize that one. For sometimes you do some, you can do simple normalizations, like min max normalization, for example. Uh, sometimes that doesn't work and sometimes you need to do some uh, adaptation or normalization to a specific uh, um, uh, image or, or data and then you use that as a, a source, a target and then uh, you, you normalize all the data to that target one. Uh, like a, a, domain, a, don a, don a domain adaptation. When you don't have, you don't have labeled data, uh, uh, you can use unsupervised ones, and we did that in some cases. Sometimes you need to do some unsupervised ones, or uh, what we normally have. So sometimes we have a small set of data that we ask to physicians to annotate, and then we have plenty of other data without non non annotated, and then we use some Smith supervised methods. Okay, and it, in some cases it's work uh, quite good. Uh, so the other one is not a question, is if I could share the contact again for further consultation. I will do that. It's here, okay. And then do the synthetic CT images produced by GANs have a good accuracy? Okay, uh, uh, yes, or let's say more or less. <laughs> uh, the big problem of synthetic CT images are uh, it was impossible to run it with the um, with the the raw resolution. Okay, it took it, it will take a lot of weeks or months. Okay, so as I said, we used a quarter of resolution to generate 300 images, and it took uh, 17 days. But we did an evaluation, so we we could have some metrics, but we did an evaluation with physicians. So what we did was to create some artificial data, then we, we reduce the, the, um, the real ones to the same resolution of the generated one, and then we ask to a physician to evaluate uh, if he can guess which one are the real ones and which one are not the real ones. And with that, uh, with that result, uh, we could find that our algorithm was quite good, not perfect, okay? And we have a lot of to improve. But uh, for the, so we didn't uh, uh, work a lot on this, um, but we have intentions to do it. And we are uh, now, right, right now working on also on, on breast for the same, for, for the same issue. Um, but maybe these, let's say, generated artificial models are the, 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 the most hard to train. Uh, it's hard to have very good images. But for, let's say, for a, um, a preliminary work that we, we did, we, we are, quite, could, uh, are quite happy with, with the result. There is a lot to do. We need more GPUs to, <laughs> to, to run it faster and to have, to have, um, to, that could improve the resolution of the image that we are generating. That, that's, that's the issue right now. Thank you again. It was a, a very interesting uh, presentation with a uh, lot of, of words and a lot of directions. And thank you for the opportunity to, to be here. Okay. Thank you. So I think uh, uh, we, we have to move on. I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, Professor Lawrence Court. Professor Lawrence Court is an associated professor with tenure at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. He, he is also a regular faculty member in the Division of School of Health Professions and the University of Texas Graduated School of Biomedical Science at Houston. Professor Court serves as the Director of the Radiation Planning System Project at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. 
And in addition uh, to his academic role, he has gained valuable professional experience in various fields. He has worked as, as an X-ray system specialist at Canon Company, a business consultant and office manager at Asia Advisor Service, and a research engineer at Sony Company. Uh, with an extensive expertise in medical physics, Professor Court has made significant contributions to the areas of radiation oncology and imaging physics, evident through his remarkable publication record. Today, Professor Court will be discussing the application of artificial intelligence to enhance access to high quality radiation therapy planning in low and middle income countries. And we are honored to have Professor Court as our distinguished speaker. And I would like to express my gratitude for his presence in this course. Now, it's my privilege to invite Professor Court to take the virtual stage and share his invaluable insights with us. Professor Court, please. Thank you very much. That's, um, that's probably the nicest introduction I've ever had. So I'm very glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm, I'm, as you said, I'm going to be talking today about the use of AI um, to improve access to high quality radiation therapy planning in low and middle income countries. Um, you know, I can't see everybody who's on the call. So I just put a picture of, of our group up here so you can see, um, at least you get to see what we look like, if nothing else. Um, so my first, let's start off with um, some conflicts of interest that I have to put up here. So you'll see as I talk through this topic that most of my understanding really has come from our development of what we're called the Radiation Planning Assistant with active collaborators across the world, especially in South Africa and the UK. And this, this is a project that we started working on uh, five or six years ago, really to try and help some of our friends in um, low middle income countries who, who just don't have enough staff. And I'll talk about that um, in a moment. I have to say, we are um, we just got cleared by the FDA 510K clear, but this is not a product that's being marketed though. Um, but this does, the good news here is that that opens up, this is a milestone for us to open up, to be able to use this tool in and starting with South Africa, then Tanzania and beyond moving forwards. Uh, project funding, et, et cetera, is listed here. So I have a, a few background slides just to sort of set the stage. So as, I'm, as many of you may realize, uh, radiation therapy is a key component of cancer care. Um, 50% or more of patients who have cancer um, benefit from radiation. Um, it's even more for some cancer types like breast cancer. And, um, you know, I'm based in Texas here. We're lucky enough that most people have some level of access to radiotherapy when they need it. But that's not true in many countries. This is a map that shows the estimated proportion of patients, cancer patients who would benefit from radiation therapy or need radiotherapy who have access to it. And you can see there's the dark green color um, that, and, and, the, and also the sort of somewhat lighter green are where most patients have some level of access. But you can see there's many countries that are um, the sort of the I don't know, sort of gray and paler, creamy color where less than 50% of the patients have access. And there's been a lot of work looking at this need over the last five or six years um, and there's, so we really know what, what benefits there would be if we could do something about that. The, the one that's really compelling to me is that there is the one that's on the right hand side. If, if we could really resolve this issue, um, do something about it, we could bring a survival benefit of almost a million patients per year um, by 2035, which is just around the corner. So that's pretty compelling. It's not just access to radiation therapy, it's also access to high quality radiation therapy. There was a study in Africa a year or two ago, where survey where they looked at the different types of treatments that were being offered, and only about a third of the operational radiotherapy clinics were offering IMRT, which as you, as you know, is what is needed to help with um, normal tissue sparing when you're treating radiation therapy. So it's not just access, it's access to high quality. There's many, many reasons for this I'm going to talk about um, in, in the next slide. But, but you know, people often talk about a shortage of linear accelerators. That's true. But the real thing that you need to, that's more difficult to resolve than that, I think, probably, is the shortage of staff. 
And it's estimated that we need something like 50,000 total radiation oncologists and physicists if we're going to do something here. And 50,000, you know, that when you, it's, that's a huge number, especially when you think these are people who, you know, they get a degree, they go to graduate school, they have residences, and all sorts of training happens. So this, it's a big deal to train this many staff. Maybe we need to do something different. Um, this slide just emphasizes the staff issue. This is um, a map showing the number of cancer cases per oncologist. So this is focusing on oncologists who, who have a major role, of course, in, the, in looking after cancer patients. And you can see there's just huge variations from some place from Europe, where you have, you know, some in, in North America, where you have somewhere between 150 and, and, and 500 cases per oncologist to many places in Africa, where there's more than 3000 cases per oncologist. So, so this is a, a massive issue. Um, so we have a lot of people we need to train or we need to, or not all, as well as we should develop solutions to help those clinical teams scale their efforts so they don't spend, have to spend so long on each individual patient, they can maybe see more patients. So why, why do you need so many people? Well, this, this, um, this slide tries, tries to sort of help explain some of that for those of you if you're not familiar with the radiation therapy process. This gives you a sort of big overview and big chunks of the different things that have to happen. And so if we start at the top left, that's where we realize they find out that the patient has cancer and there's a decision to use radiation therapy. So the first, one of the first things that happens once that decision has been made is to take a, a, scan, a CT scan, which is used for most patients, not all. The physician then decides on the doses and both to the targets and also to the normal structures to try and reduce or minimize and control um, any side effects. And then they go in and they draw everything, the targets that they want to treat on the CT and also the normal tissues. Once that's done, even in 2023, you'd be amazed how much of that is done by hand. Once that is done, they pass that information off to a planner. Some places have dosimetrists who are specialized planners, some places the physics staff or the, or the residents um, or some other folk do the planning. But in any case, the role is the same. So you have to decide on the beam arrangements, you calculate dose, you try and optimize everything to give the best dose to what you're trying to treat while not giving um, as much dose to the normal tissues. Once the planner has come up with what they think is a good plan, they then go back to the radiation oncologist. There's some discussion. Um, depending on the complexity of the case, there may be some iterations in the plan as the physician wants to make a different compromise to that that the planner had made in terms of dose to targets and normal tissues. And eventually you end up with a, with a plan which then has to go through a series of QA because as you probably realize, radiation can do a lot of good, but it can also do some harm. And so we have um, physicists and physicians and dosimetrists, therapists, all sorts of people review the plan and make sure that it is safe and effective. So, and, and so there's a lot of handoffs, there's a lot of people involved. A lot of these processes take a long time, like contouring for head and neck can take a couple of hours, potentially the plans can for, for something complex could take half a day or more. So it's really per patient. So it takes a lot of time and effort. Now, the great news is, great news is that we're in 2023, where most of these tasks have a very, we're basically perfect for the use of AI or some sort of automation. And so I've, I've drawn sort of circles around the parts that we've been working on, but really almost everything, you have to take a CT scan, I suppose, but it, almost everything else has potential for use, for the use of AI, maybe not to replace people, but to supplement and augment and help them scale their efforts. So, so we've got the contouring, that's that in many cases is a done deal, especially for normal tissues. And I'll talk about that. The planning um, can be automated. In many cases, if the planning is automated to a high degree, that reduces the amount of iterations that we have on the third row. And so the impact of that is quite significant because it means that there's less backwards and forwards between the planner and the, um, and the doctor. And then QA as well. So there's, there's definitely a role for people in the QA. And I'll talk about risk because this is not it's not always a glass half full or rosy glasses. It's um, there are some risks, but but overall, we can really make a significant impact on workflows. And so if you can pull all of this together, um, which is really coming together now, you can change the workflow go back. So we change it from this 
to this. So we still, at this point at least, we still need the CT, we still need the doctor to say, this is what I want to treat. The middle part can be uh, assigned to some sort of AI. Um, we're not quite there in terms of end to end, but we're very close, or, you know, not, not long, far away at all. And then you have um, somebody has to look at the plan, make sure it looks what it is, what you want. And then there's a series of QA that still has to happen. Um, and then the patient is treated. I'll get back to the QA towards the end of today's presentation. But what are the benefits? The benefits are potentially huge. So we've got gains in efficiency per patient. We can save several hours of physician's time and treatment planner's time. Um, we can reduce handoffs because we're, we're reducing the number of people that have to be involved in each set, step of the process. And so what that means is that you don't have, I don't finish doing my contouring and then it sits on someone's desk until they're ready. And then when they're ready, hopefully I've communicated properly what I wanted them to do. And so there's a risk there and there's an efficiency loss because it's really just not being worked on. And so, so we can remove, reduce that. So that gives us gains in efficiency and also in safety. There's also potential gains in quality. Um, there's quite a lot of, it, of data out there, especially for contouring, that there's the people, you know, different people draw different things. And that doesn't have a huge effect when it's a normal tissue that you're trying to avoid, but it does have a significant effect when it's the targets. If, you drew, if I draw a different target to somebody else, then um, we're gonna treat the patient differently. That, that, that's important to know. Whereas or AI and automation can potentially uh, reduce that variability. Again, reduced handoffs also reduces safety. And then in terms of research potential, so it's not just clinical potential, research potential, once you're treating all these patients in this really consistent way, which has not happened up till now, even in clinical trials, really, we can really start to understand treatment response, the toxic effects of the radiation. We can look at quantitative, quantitative assessment of trying to predict outcomes. So if this patient isn't based on the imaging, are they in a high risk or a low risk? There's all sorts of things we can do once we have, um, once we've opened up this, this AI. So where, where are we? So in terms of normal tissue contouring, um, deep learning has really solved this problem. And so this is just one example. Um, this is a breast patient, obviously one of these sets, this is to see if you're awake on Friday afternoon in Portugal, Friday morning here. If, if you know, one of these is automatic, one of these is manual. I don't know if you can tell the difference. You're testing yourself. I'm not going to make you write the answers in the chat or anything. But in this case, the one on the left is the automatic. And the point is that you really can't tell the difference. There are differences for sure, but they're the same differences you would have if, if you contoured something and then I contoured it. You might think that's an easy thing to contour. This is an example of upper abdomen with the various structures there. Um, and this is a tool developed in our group that has been, it's used in our own clinic for 20 or 30 patients a month. Um, and this I've been told saves an hour or two of contouring for the physicians who are doing this themselves prior to this tool being released. And again, one of these is automatic, one of these is manual. The point is, well, in this case, the one on the right is the machine generated, but they're really, really similar. And they're not different in any meaningful way that would affect the patient treatments. So we've been talking, if you're in radiation therapy, you know we've been talking about um, auto-contouring for, for years, decades possibly. But it and it's always been a case where you run the auto-contouring and then and then you you just know you're gonna have to make edits. And that's that's really because um because every patient is different, so it doesn't work quite that well. And that's an example of that is seen in the top left with atlas-based contouring, which is where you have many several different patients all contoured, you then deformably register those to the current patient, pull over the contours and then fuse them to give you a final contour. That works really well. That was state of the art until deep learning came along a couple of years ago. And it does work pretty well until there's something different between your patient and the Atlas patients. And this example in the top left is a case where the neck was tilted back further than, than, was, um, than we found in the Atlas patients. And so everything's in the right place, but you can see the eyes you know, they are in the eye where the eyes are, but they're just not quite right. Um, same thing. Uh, but when you take deep learning because of the amount of data that's used and all the augmentation that happens, we don't have that problem anymore. And you get the results on the bottom left. And that's really extended to everything. So the, on the right are just examples from our group. Um, 
Uh, the top is nodal CTVs, where one of those lines is the clinical and physician drawn, and one is manual. And the bottom are different structures for female pelvis. But the point is that this is this sort of anatomical contouring. If it's not being done, it can be done. Um, and you're going to see this. The vendors are going to come out with this. Everybody's going to come out with this. All sorts of startups. Um, and so we can really expect, it's just a couple more examples, but we can really just expect to see normal tissue contouring all over the place um, in, the, you know, in, the, in the next year or two. In terms of how good is it, um, generally for normal tissue, we find um, from our results, we find sort of around about 90% or more can be used as is. And then the remaining 10% just needs minor edits um, for and that that's that's from our, our results, but we I expect it would be the same from other you know from the vendors and what have you, um, other research groups. In terms of targets, it's usually um, it's not as good, and that's because of the differences between how people like to do things. So there is a a complication in here that um, different people at different clinics like to do things slightly differently, and that's going to be an ongoing challenge in terms of deployment moving forwards. Okay, that's contouring. For planning, planning's not quite as advanced, I guess, as, as auto contouring, um, but it's getting there. This is, um, one of these is a manually optimized plan. The other is an automatically optimized plan. It's head and neck. We're trying to treat the red shaded area with the red isodose. You can see they look very similar. You're supposed to be guessing, by the way, which one is which right now. Um, in this case, again, it's the one on the right is the automatic. This is based on knowledge-based planning. You can see they're very similar. When we showed these to the radiation oncologist, they like them both. Obviously, they like the one on the left because that was the clinical plan. The one on the right, um, the automatic plan, very similar, slightly less spreading of the dose into the oral cavity. So they had a slight preference for that, but they're both acceptable. And so the point there really is that you can very easily... Um, once you've developed the system, you can get very nice plans for these patients that are automatic. There's quite a lot of data out um, on knowledge-based planning. Uh, this is a this is this here is from a really nice paper from UCSD San Diego, where they introduced knowledge-based planning into their own clinical practice. And so the figure on the right-hand side shows going left to right is basically going through time. Each dot is a different patient. And it shows how the variations in the doses to these different structures varies from patient to patient until, until this point where we go from white to gray. And that's where they introduce the knowledge-based planning. And you can see two things that happen, both of which are important. One is that the average dose to the structures in all cases goes down. So that means the plant quality is better probably. And also the variability. So the inter-patient variation goes down as well. So we've got more consistency. So introducing knowledge-based planning at their clinic improved quality and consistency, which is great. And that's what we're all after. It's not just advanced treatments. You know, we, we talk about VMAT, IMRT, and all this sort of stuff. That's terrific. Um, but there are other ways of treating patients that can be useful depending on your resources or on the patient characteristics. Um, this is just an example of uh, treating cervical cancer with what's known as a four field box treatment. And that, that's basically having beams come from the four orthogonal angles um, and the beams are shaped um, with, with shielding that you, like you can see on the right hand side. So it's like a shadows game essentially. And so we automated this process based on, um, on auto contouring of the bones and then the rules of the shielding are based on the bones in the beams eye view. We found when we used uh, when we started this project, which was before we knew anything about deep learning, we were using atlas-based contouring for the bones, and we had a success rate. I think it was close to like ninety percent. And you know, you'd, you'd think bones would be easy to contour, but and they are sort of. But but you know, once you've got a patient with disease in the bone or maybe um, compressed vertebrae, vertebral bodies, you really it really does get a bit more complicated, and the Atlas-based contouring was not good at the, with those exceptions, which turned out to be about 10% of patients. Deep learning, though, because you train it with so much more patients, it can really accommodate that. And we got our success rate up to um, 97%. So, so even for these simple treatments, deep learning has quite a nice role. Uh, this is just another example of, of what you might consider a pretty straightforward treatment. This is um, 
cranial spinal irradiation for pediatric cases. And um, these are a series of um, quite straightforward looking open fields with a little bit of subfields going on. Um, but, and so it, it's not complicated exactly to do by hand, but there's so many fields and so many things that you can get wrong um, that it takes a long time to, to create the plan and also to, um, to check it. We've got this working um, scripted for our own planning system here, and it, it, it's minutes to do the whole thing, and then rather than hours. So it, it just makes, in terms of workflow and risk of making a manual mistake, it, there's some big advantages here. So, so, so auto planning. So auto planning is basically, um, I feel like it. We, if we haven't done it, it's just because we haven't done it. It's totally doable. Just some examples here. We've got VMAT and IMRT for head and neck and cervical cancer on the left, some simpler treatments for cervix and rectum in the middle. We've got post mastectomy breast, which are sort of tangential fields that, that, that go towards the chest wall, try to treat the chest wall, but avoid the lung plus superclav fields, and then um, treatment of vertebral bodies. So, you know, we do treat vertebral bodies um, quite often. Um, and one of the big challenges is making sure you treat the right one. Uh, so what we've got in our automated tool here is we have a tool that classifies them, contours them, and then we have a separate tool that also classifies them, and contours them, and then we cross compare. And we found that works very well at um, making sure that we don't accidentally contour or treat the uh, plan to the wrong vertebral body, which is something that um, people in the clinic will, will have either experienced or see because it can, you can make mistakes there manually. So we're trying to avoid that. So, so in terms of acceptability, we're sort of about the same as contours, really. It's somewhere around 90% or so of plans are generally considered to be usable either as is or with um, sort of my, relative pretty minor tweaks. Um, this on the right hand side is a study that um, the Ocean Road Cancer Institute in Tanzania did independently where they ran our tools, these automated tools on their patients, um, just not no treating, just just retrospective planning. Um, and they liked all of the all of the plans and the contours. So we've been putting these tools into our own clinic. You know, we've the, the vendors are going to be putting them in these tools in. There's a gazillion other companies and researchers, so we're not unique in any in any sense. But but it gives you an idea that um, you know the of the quality, I suppose, because once it's there, you can you can say, oh yeah, I've got excellent um, agreement or the quality quality is great in a retrospective sense. But when you put it into the clinic, that's when you really learn if people like it and if they're going to use it. And um, so we've had head and neck auto contouring in our clinic for, I think, probably three years now, um, used on almost every patient. That's about a thousand patients a year. Cervical cancer, same story. We've got whole brain treatment planning and upper abdomen contouring. Um, and we've also got breasts, which I didn't, I, I didn't add to this slide, but we're, we're, it's continually used by the clinicians. And then in terms of, you know, this talk is about how do we help people in low and middle income countries. So this tool that we've developed is the same tool, but it we're making it with the plan, at least, is to make it available um, through the web. So you upload your CT and it gives you back contours and plans. We've gone that route because it's it's cheap. So these a lot of these are AI tools, you know, the development might be expensive because you need somebody who knows what they're doing and you need all the good data and this sort of stuff. Once you've done that, running costs are actually quite cheap. Um, and so we can offer this. The plan for us is to offer this for free to clinics that, that won't benefit. I don't have the money, for example, to benefit from vendor solutions. Uh, but this is the process. So there is data upload and download, which is a bit clunky, I have to say. Um, but it is what it is, and it's it's cheap to run. Okay, so that's that's that that's the good side. So it looks great. You know, we all publish papers, we say, yeah, these is um. This all looks amazing. Um, you should all use it. Um, but there's risk as well. So once once you have less people involved, you can imagine um, there's less, okay, people might make mistakes. So there, maybe there's less risk in that sense, but there's also less chance of them, pe those people catching errors. So so these are just two examples of CTs that if you're, you're you, you will have seen things like this, the one on the left, the field of view is too small, the one on the right, 
um, these hip hip replacements are giving massive artifacts. Once, if we're going to create a treatment for this, we will do something different to what we do for the typical patient. So we'll have maybe we have different beam angles. We'll do some overrides for density, trying to deal with these artifacts a little bit differently. However, if you put these into, you know, if you press the auto contour auto plan button, most likely it's going to give you an answer. And it, most likely it's not going to be the right one. So that's something we need to really think about as we deploy, especially once we get away from these sort of task-based automation solutions. So if we're just contouring, just doing auto contouring, then someone reviews the contours, makes edits, and then passes that on to the planner, who then may have, maybe they've got a different button, auto planning. That's one thing. You've still got some people in the middle there to intervene and try and stop things reaching the patient. Once you combine everything, which is the way this is going to go for sure, you need to really be careful about, about these risks. So there's a few things you can do to try and mitigate these. One is to use AI for quality assurance. So I've got a few slides just to show that. But the approach, there's different approaches that, that you can take. The one that we started with is... Um, it's pretty much a hammer and nail, you know, well, you know, we've got a hammer, what should we do with it type approach. But um, so we, we take the idea that um, we have in radiation therapy where for like dose calculations, we often export the plan to a different software, recalculate the dose in that different software with independent dose calculations and make sure there's some level of agreement to make sure that the dose calculation isn't off in some fashion. We took that same idea and applied it to all these other things like contouring. So we have our auto contouring, and then we have an independent algorithm, which um, we, we fight constantly internally about what independent means. But basically, we want things that will fail, the two algorithms that when they're right, they're right, but when they fail, they fail differently. And so that's an example is shown on the top where you've got a head and neck case. You can see for each of those structures there, there's two contours. One is a primary, one is a QA contour, or verification contour. On the left, they agree that would just be passed through. On the right, there's some disagreement, probably because of the surgery that patient had, that's giving the one of the algorithms some challenges. We're not really commenting on whether it's the primary or the verification because we don't, the, the computer doesn't know. But we can then say to the user, hang on, there's something weird going on here. You better have another look. Same thing applies to straightforward planning approaches like the four field box treatments of cervix that I talked about. That you can see on the bottom where those lines are just showing the shape of the field. You've got red, a red field and you've got a dotted yellow field. On the left, it agrees. So that would just get passed on to the to passed on. No comment to the user. On the right, there's a there's a, some disagreement. In this case, it's the primary that's not doing very well, but it could be the other way around. And, and we don't really comment. We just say to the user, please have a look because there's something going on. So that's one way that you can use AI for, uh, for quality assurance. Um, we've also, um, more recently, in the last couple of years, managed to use deep learning to predict what a plan should look like. Um, so here's, here's an example um, where the, on the top, Oh, this was meant to be a test, but I gave you the answer. So you, I guess you're all passed. But the, the, the top, we have the predicted dose distribution. And on the bottom, we have the clinical dose distribution for the same patient. And you can see that they look very similar. On the right, we have the do have dose volume histogram curves, which, which give you an indication of how that dose is spread out um, among in, in the different structures where one of the, where the, um, the solid line is the clinical and the dotted line is or the dashed line rather, is the predicted dose distribution. You can see we're doing a pretty good job of predicting what these plans should look like. So if you create one automatically or manually, you can then compare it with this, um, with this prediction and see what your agreement is. And um, here's, here's, here's an example um, where the one on the left actually is the predicted dose. The one on the right is, is the um, clinical dose. And the one on the right, it's not a terrible plan. You know, you're, you're getting this sort of similar sparing of most of the normal structures than as you would hope for. But you can see it's sort of noisier. There's more spread of the, of the lower dose to the back of the neck, which we like to avoid. And so a comparison like this could, if, you know, if you're maybe the only planner in your clinic, because your clinic is the only clinic in the country, which is perfectly possible, 
you don't really have anyone to ask, but you could run the predicted dose and you could say, oh, that's what it's supposed to look like, or that's what I should try to get it to look like. And that would that would help you in quality assurance. And also there's a role potentially um, for training. Let's talk about um, some other risks. So that's ways you can sort of build things in to try and catch errors. We've got to really think about what errors can happen. And so one of the ways that we've looked at that is with a failure modes and effects analysis, which basically you, you it's a fairly soul destroying process to go through, I have to tell you, but you, 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 you over time you go through and you, you try and um, try and list every single thing that can go wrong in your workflow. And then for everything that can go wrong, you score it in terms of how likely is it to happen, if it does happen, how bad would it be? And, and also how likely are you to catch it? So if it's if you're likely to catch it, it's not so it's not um not quite so bad, but if you're not likely to catch it, that's a bad thing. And so just an example here. So if you've got a way of set positioning your patient that that fails and you have to go back to rescan your patient, that's not really any risk to the patient, but it is an inconvenience. And so when you multiply your current severity and detectability, you get something called risk priority number. And you can see here that's pretty low and because basically because the risk is low and it's easy to detect because you can just look at the scan and you say, oh yeah, it didn't work. If you contour the body incorrectly, that's actually relatively difficult to detect because you tend not to be focusing on the body when you're looking at a plan, you're focusing on the on the other normal structures and on the targets. So it's more difficult to it. it it's reasonably likely to happen. It's it's not you know unless it's a really bad error. It's 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 going to give you a sort of minor dosimetric error in most cases, but it is quite difficult to detect if you're higher up. Yeah. And so you run through all these things, and then you prioritize in terms of what your risk priority number is. So we've done this for automated planning, and. This is the top 10 that we found for our own system. It's our own system, but you know you can imagine it wouldn't be that different for a commercial system through one of your um, radiation oncology vendors or, or one of the startups or what have you. And you can see you know, software error is here in the middle, but most of the things that can go wrong are not really the software because the software has been tested so many times. It, occasionally it'll do something wacky for sure. Um, but the main risks are automation bias. So this is the problem that happens where I say, well, it's always right. It's AI. It's always right. So I'm not going to check it as carefully as I would if, if my, my friend Jeremy was doing the plan because I don't trust him very high. So that's automation bias. There's a real risk of that. And that's being demonstrated. And then the other is operator error because, OK, we think we're automating everything. We're automating a lot. There's still a lot of places that humans have to do stuff, and those can those can um, introduce error. We did look at um, how well we can use AI-based QA to reduce the risk profile, um, and you can definitely reduce the risk profile, mostly because you improve the detectability, because most of these things we're sticking at the end of the process. So you still do your contours, you do your plan, and then we've got this QA process at the end um, that hopefully is improving detectability. So if your contours are off or your plan has something weird in it, hopefully that will help catch it. We found we've done some hazard testing for this, and overall across all the different types of QA that we've got in place right now, we catch around seventy percent of the errors. That was where we introduced errors intentionally and looked at whether we could catch them. So about seventy percent. So that's good, but not perfect. So there's still a really important role for um, checking everything really carefully. Um, and so, so that brings me to how do we safely deploy these tools? We've done it. We spent a lot of time looking at risk and how do we mitigate and manage this risk? So the first thing is the, um, the manual plan check. So even, we're not there yet, really, but even when we've got end-to-end -end automation where stuff's automatically contoured, automatically planned, we're, the role, some of that time that you save in automating, you're going to have to invest at the end in the, in the checks by physicians and physics and dosimetry and therapy. All of these different people look for different things and find different things. And there's going to be things that I don't think it's going to be more likely that errors happen 
but there are going to be errors and then and then the errors that do happen are more likely to get to that final stage where you catch them with the checks uh, because there's no one else in there. Uh, training is really important. Um, I didn't talk about off-label use, but off-label use is definitely going to happen. That's an example of that would be if you have auto contouring for prostate patients and you don't yet have it for cervix patients, for example. You might say, well, a lot of the, you know, I still got to contour the bladder and the rectum and what have you. And that's, that's there in both cases. So I'll run the prostate model and I'll just delete the prostate because that won't work. And what you don't know is it hasn't been tested on all that other on, on female patients. You don't know what's going to happen. And so the risk is definitely higher um, and requires additional checks. So off label use is a risk, automation bias is a risk. All these things are a risk. And so training and commissioning, which is item number four, is really important because it helps the local users understand um, understand what they're dealing with. You know, it's not just a tool that you press go and it gives you an answer. You've got to understand that it doesn't always work. And when it doesn't work, what's it likely to do? Because its failure modes are going to be different to what you have with people. Um, and then automated QA. As I said, automated QA, I think, is um, quite important. Okay, so. Um, Two more slides, two or three more slides. Um, I think AI is really, is here. Um, there's no question about that. It's gonna touch all aspects of radiotherapy planning, contouring, planning QA, um, as well as training. Um, it's gonna help us with training. Um, that's gonna give us improved efficiency, quality, consistency. Um, there is going to be some level of customization that we need to do. I, I didn't talk about this too much apart from in the target contouring, but there are there is a range of what people consider to be acceptable in terms of contouring and planning. Just different clinics have different experiences, different backgrounds, different patient populations. And so customization is important. Um, manual plan review, as I said, very important. And... Um, you know, you've really just got to think about things like automation bias, off-label use, and the other risks that can happen. On the right-hand side, I have um, the results of a survey um, of, of clinics that was done to look at the barriers, potential barriers to use in, using AI-based planning. And you can see that the, the main ones, the top three, they're not quality barriers, actually. These are what people think are the barriers. It was physicians, dosimetrists, physicists. Um, but internet, so if it's a web-based system like as or cloud-based, what have you, um, internet is, a, is an anticipated barrier. Costs, um, like I said, we're hoping to do as for free, um, but people are worried about costs. And then administrative, um, PHI, sharing of data, this sort of thing is, is going to be a massive challenge as we move forwards. Okay, so back to that map that I showed at the start. You know, there is this massive... Uh, difference in availability of cancer care across the world that, you know, I feel like we're, um, you know, we, basically we have no choice but to try and do our best to do something about that. Whether we succeed or not, I don't know. But I think AI really could be the equalizer here because, um, you know, people are so important and people will remain to be important as far as I can tell. But um, with, there's just not enough people with sufficient training, and this can really help scale our efforts um, by improving workflows as well as consistency and quality um, and plan QA and things like that. It should also help, I think, um, with involvement in clinical trials. So you can imagine, and there's a lot of data on this, that most clinical trials that create the information that we use to treat patients like prescriptions and fractionation schedules and things like that. Most of them come from high income countries. And then we just take that data and we apply it elsewhere. Um, maybe okay to do that. I don't know, but definitely participation would be in, in clinical trials across the world would be, would be a good thing. And one of the hurdles, of course, is that it takes time to, to do the plan following the requirements for whatever trial it is, and then to do the paperwork and what have you. And that's where these sort of AI automation approaches, I think, can really help. And then training. I think AI can really help with training. Okay, so that's my, my final thought. Um, thank you very much um, for inviting me and um, for listening and staying on Friday afternoon. Um, 
and thank you again for that nice introduction. I should have recorded it. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, in the Q and A, we have um, some questions. I, I think the first one is not a question, but uh, um, I, I think you have access to to the Q and A, but I, I can also read it to you. Yeah. Um, Professor, this is a great work you are doing. I'm a medical physics from Kenya, been practicing for years and the challenge uh, you highlight are true. I'm interested in upscaling my capacity in these advanced AI, AI methods, countering planning. I will appreciate if you could link me with a program that could help in this regard. So, um, yeah, so there's there's you know, obviously I talked about our group a lot, but there's lots of other groups doing um, auto contouring. Um, deep learning has really enabled places to um, to do very high quality work without need, without the, the massive infrastructure that, that was, and, and background that was needed before. Um, so I think a lot, there's lots of academic groups out there. If you mean in terms of a training program, you know, I guess those would be like the PhD pretty much anywhere. I think that's doing like medical physics type PhDs or data science um, is a good place to start. Um, you can just maybe just message me and we can talk about what what exactly what you're looking for in detail. Um, yeah, I mean, there's lots of options out there. It's a very it's actually a very crowded field, if anything. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. Uh, we have another question. Thanks for, for your great presentation. Yes, training is very important. The lack of staff is not only related to doctors and physicists. Uh, in some countries, the RTTs, radiation therapists and radiographers and or dosimetrists have no academic education. Often it's, it is a professional training which can affect the quality of the treatment because no matter how many AI tools are included in the radiotherapy workflow, if the staff that performs the validations are not well-trained, big mistakes can happen. As you said before, critical thinking is crucial. AI will improve the quality of RT, but sometimes will fail. What we don't know is when. Uh, what AI training do you recommend? Yeah, so, <laughs> so that's the sort of stuff that um, stops me sleeping well at night. I think about this stuff constantly, um, you know, because we do, you know, I know I said our focus is, is low and middle income countries, but we do deploy our own tools in our own clinic as well. Um, and the, they're in, li in real life use every day. And we have seen situations that have sort of, that have led, you know, that, that, that have um, fed the, the stuff that I talk about in the presentation. I think, you know, the understanding the importance of the quality assurance is one of the most important factors here because I mean, it, quality assurance is important, but it's often neglected to some degree. If you, if you especially if you're short staffed, you create the plan, you, 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 you know, you're trying, there's a patient waiting and also your next plan is waiting. There's so much to do. Um, and, and maybe AI can help re reduce that stress a little bit, but having that QA to check for those mistakes is really important. So I think training people, um, you know, in, in what can go wrong, um, and because especially AI will do things that you don't expect. So, so for example, um, well, it goes back to what I was saying, I suppose, when I showed those, the picture with the hip, the artificial hips, AI will always do something, but it doesn't, but it's not a person and it, it, it has a lot of experience, but it's not the same. And so what you might find, for example, if you have like a, a well, example we had in the early days, I suppose, if you've got like a, a, a an AI to a deep learning tool for auto contouring of the breast tissues and all the structures around that, that area, and then you run the same contouring on a, on a, patient that has a different field of view in the superior or inferior direction, it can find stuff to contour that's not right. So we've had like the breast might appear in the in the mandible or something, you know, stuff that you just, that, that you know, like a human just wouldn't do. You just, it just wouldn't happen. But, but, but in that case, it was because our breast model had never seen a mandible before. So it didn't know what to do. So it stuck something up there. Um, and you can, similar things can happen. Um, 
like it's surgery when when okay you're you're trained you've trained your model on lots and lots and lots of patients but um you know we find like the head and neck models often will give you a lens even if you've had your lenses removed or um a, a abdomen model tends to give you a kidney even if you've had it if you even if you only got one kidney it'll give you two they do do some things that um that the human the humans probably wouldn't do um so i think the training to understand that is really important and and the the other part that's really important is I, I think i called it commissioning but it's that really understanding when you introduce a tool don't just say press this button and it will give you something you got to really go through and talk about the risks I, I've, I've really come around to to being in favor of a sort of risk based training not just showing press this button press that button it's going to give you an answer it's going to be great which is what um you know vendors tend to do they're, they're there to tell you what buttons to press it's really like okay press this button press button it's going to be great but it might go wrong and if it does this is what you need to think about and uh, so that that sort of training i think is is going to become more and more important as as our roles change over over time can you speak about simulation uh, imaging q and a uh, previous to automated planning uh, do you know some commercial solutions to automated planning okay yes so simulation imaging um not sure what to talk about so so there are the role of the the you know when you take the ct is still important um ai is going to have different there's different effects so one of the risks that we have found um with ai or potential risks is when if you if your ai is expecting a different workflow than um than your clinic so you know, people will develop their models as, or their plan either for contouring or planning or both based on some process. And we will work in a hospital and we will somehow, even though in our minds, we know that different places do stuff differently, we, we somehow can't get away from the fact that surely everyone does it the same as us, even though we know they don't. And you develop these tools that are focused on a particular type of approach that, and then if you introduce your AI, either it will just fail because something's different, or if you tell the, the clinic, oh, we do it this way, it's been trained this way rather, you've got to do it that way. That's actually not a bright idea either necessarily because expecting people to change their workflow just because of some new AI thing um, is risky because some people will change and some people won't, and then you'll introduce errors. So there is, so the, the simulation imaging um, is important. Um, Oh, I see now it says simulation imaging QA. So I think I don't, I'm, not, I'm still not quite sure what the, where the, which direction the question was trying to go, but um, I think there is a lot of roles of AI for um, QAing like image quality, things like that. And there are groups we've done, we're doing a little bit of this, but there's groups who've done a lot more on taking the patient image and, and doing things like extracting resolution and noise characteristics and things like that. So I think there are some roles there um jumping to the commercial solutions for automated planning yes there are quite a few um not as many as there are for auto contouring auto contouring there's if you go to any of the conference medical physics or radiation oncology conferences there's automated contouring companies all over the place now um I think they're actually going to have a really hard time because, you know, as the vendors start to stick auto contouring further, um, I guess it's downstream. So toward like the CT scanners giving you auto contouring, things like that, as well as the big um, treatment planning system vendors, it's going to be that there's, there's, there's a lot of that um, in terms of auto planning, all of the radiation therapy treatment planning system vendors are putting stuff out there in varying degrees. And there's, um, I think I only know of one company outside of that um, rad formation, which is is a, uses it, it sort of attaches itself to Eclipse, um, but there may be others. Um, but I think I, you know, I think okay, contouring maybe is a little bit easier because contours do tend, you know, a parotid is the same, it doesn't matter where you are. Whereas a treatment plan can be quite different, so there may be it's easier to do contouring than planning. Uh, but I'm sure they're gonna. 
you know, I think, you know, we're, we're, we're creating a solution, but I think in the future, there's going to be so many that I'm not quite sure how we'll navigate that, but there's, there's going to be a lot. I, I have a few questions. It's, it's very interesting. It's a topic, a fascinating topic. Um, you mentioned that um, the, the training of the AI um, is based on some assumptions uh, about the workflow uh, of the um, of the acquisition of for the planning and the, for the control. But my my concern is that, or my question is, does the uh, auto control and the, and the, the auto planning um, is um, is influenced by the the type of machine that creates the image? Yeah, so it doesn't seem to be. Um, at least what we've seen so far. So, so in there are some exceptions, but in terms of like if you if you've got a like most of our you know we would tend to plan with with like Philips for example. If you've trained with Philips CT CTs from a Philips scanner and then you run it on um, on a Canon or or you know GE or whatever, it doesn't really seem to matter. And we did we did do some studies looking at reconstruction parameters. Other people have done this too. Um, and and where we sort of simulated adding noise to see what what that would have, and it doesn't really these these tools seem pretty robust to that. They, the differences that you see though are not not because of scanner, at least what I've seen so far. It's not the scanner that's the challenge. It's more to do with the protocol that you are imposing on the patient. So so like a breath hold. Um, for example, gives you a different image quality to if you've got a 4D scanner and then you create a, a, an yes. average, right? They just look different. Um, and so that that is like our abdomen contouring that I was talking about, that was trained on breath hold images. When we run it on, um, on averages created from a 4D, it's, it's not as good. The contrast is poorer in those images, doesn't look as good. Um, the... What else? So, you know, and, and if you try to run it on a cone beam CT, I think you, we haven't actually tried that. We should try that. But I, th I can imagine that it's just not going to work as well because the, you know, the information is just not there. So there are some differences there. Um, you know, we did, because of the way the data is augmented, we did, um, it, patient orientation doesn't seem to be a massive issue. So we did, like our abdomen plans were all done on um, supine patients for the training. And then um, a few weeks ago, we were asked someone had, you know, a thousand prone patients they wanted to run this on. And um, we just, we ran it and um, it worked perfectly fine. So it was quite <laughs> remarkable. Yeah. So, so there's some things that, um, but there's things like the breath hold, I think is one. Oh, another one is diet. So if there's different, if you've got like, we found like, um, where you've, if you've got like a high fiber diet and it, it gives you like contrast, this sort of contrast into bowels, that that can give you a challenge. Oh, contrast media. So if you don't train, with, like at our institution, uh, for whatever reason, we don't, in for radiation therapy, they don't use contrast for their, for their SIM CTs. I know that's, I, I, at least I understand that's pretty unusual, but and if you train including some contrast, that seems to work quite well. If you don't, some things like kidneys um, will fail um, and probably other stuff too that I can't think of. So, so there are some differences, that, but it's more to do with how you're taking the images than what equipment you're using to take the images. Okay, so um, that's led to, to, to my other question is because if, uh, if it would depend on the scanners, the vendors would have a, a advantage, but... Uh, uh, without that advantage, it's it's difficult to to push to push over the 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 the, the software with uh, from the vendors. So uh, we can argue that uh, your software or another software that uh, is the the best software in the world could be uh, sent could be available worldwide for uh, everyone and. Uh, could be the the best option, and 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 then the price could be also be dramatically decreased. So, uh, your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely true, and there are um, commercial solutions that sort of sit between the scanner 
and the planning system so that your, you know, your images go through that route and so everything's contoured by the time it gets to you. I, I don't know about cost. I think that that's a really, in, I think it's going to be really, it's quite exciting time to be looking at this sort of stuff actually. And like, I can't imagine, because in theory, you know, in theory, these bigger companies at least, they've developed these tools that once you stick them on, on the cloud, I'm not saying there's no cost involved because I know there's regulatory and all sorts of stuff, yes, but, of but it's relatively cheap, you know? And so they should be able to, and, and I hope they will, they should be able to offer these to the clinics that haven't got all this spare money um, to, to, to use. And, and that's, you know, in a way you can, that's an investment for them and it helps people's lives. It helps all sorts of stuff. So, I, you know, maybe they'll do that. Maybe they won't. I don't, I mean, I don't know quite how that all works. The smaller companies I've seen, um, some of them have donated equipment to, to places that need it. I've seen some of that, um, but they're, 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 they're going to be fighting to stay alive. I think, you know, <laughs> it's, it's such a competitive environment. So I don't know where that's going to go. And the thing that we've created, you know, we're going to, you know, the best thing for us that could happen for us would be that those those top two or three companies would say, oh, yeah, we're going to offer our auto planning and contouring tools to to the to the low resource clinics for free. And then that sort of we're not in business exactly, but we'll put us out of business and that would be great. And we go do something else. But if that doesn't happen, our, our plan is to sort of help help those places. So I, I, don't, I, I mean, I just who knows where this is going to go. But this I think this is really a, an opportunity doesn't matter who takes it i suppose but it's an opportunity to really be able to offer these higher quality improved consistency plans in a much broader sense as possible if you have to if you have to train individuals to do this okay uh, and another question is you you said that uh, the goal is to automate uh, automatize everything or at almost everything and uh, we are very close how close <laughs> Yeah, I think we're actually very close. So, so I think, um, well, there's two aspects to this. The the sort of the the little the little secret that I haven't really mentioned is contouring the tumor is actually not that straightforward, and getting it right, it, that's something that um, that's 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 the next part. But in terms of normal tissue auto contouring, it's done. So. Um, it may not be actually completely done, but the technology is there. There's no reason not to do it. So I think that is now and in the next two years will be out there. Um, auto planning is also mostly, I feel like, you know, I feel like at least for our group, we know what to do. We just haven't necessarily done it, but I think, you know, we can do it. So I think the planning is there. It's probably going to be, I feel like it's going to be, it's sort of a, maybe an 80% use as is rate for most things is where we're heading with this. And then the the 20% the of patients that that's not true of are going to be patients with un, some unusual anatomy or extra large tumors or, um, you know, something that, that is different. And those will require a lot of care and attention to make sure that they don't get given some substandard automated plan um but i think that's you know within five years i think that's that's all done the gtv bigger question yeah that's a i mean that that maybe 10 years should but that should be enough i think um yeah, I mean, unless unless things like immunotherapy and things, you know, if, if you if you're just using the radiation to sort of get everything else going, and you don't have to treat quite as accurately as we think we do, maybe that would change that, and you would be oh, able to okay. accept things. Um, but other than that, yeah, I think GTV is longer term, but um, everything else, very very close. Okay, I, I have a final question. You you mentioned also that. Um, uh, when you look at the dose, you 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 saw that the the, the introduction of this um, this uh, kind of AI uh, optimized the dose. And my question is, uh, it also optimized the the time in the machine for the patient. 
Oh, that's a good question. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's a very good question. So we haven't really looked at that. Um, I feel, I don't know what you feel. I feel like um, with VMAP planning, um, that that we we're, we're less worried about the time in the machine, um, and 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 haven't really, you know, we used to plan when I started planning with with VMAP, we would try very hard to do everything with two arcs. Um, what we found with automation is if you add a third arc, um, it just it really helps with the consistency, and so because you don't have somebody sort of fine tuning, but a third arc really seems to help. And so we did that after I was stubborn for quite probably way longer than I should have been and trying to keep two arcs. When we added a third arc, nobody commented at all. So there was no, no one said, oh, that's too long. So I guess it's okay. Um, so, but no, we haven't really, you know, we haven't done stereo though. We haven't done any of these sort of long, looked at these longer treatments. I think that's actually an interesting question. Um, yeah, I mean, what we, I suppose the only thing we did that's, that, that, that addresses a tiny part of your question is for cervix, we do have like four field box treatments and we also have VMAT. So if you're in a clinic where um, time on the stream, or time on the um, machine was really um, at a premium, or maybe your physics QA time was a premium, you would you could go with the full field box um, for certain patients and and reduce you know sort of do that balance. Um, but no, we haven't thought about time. Um, we have thought a little bit about um, sort of robustness to errors on the machine and and commissioning errors and things like that. So. And what we've found is um, automated, at least for head and neck. I don't. I can't. I guess I can't speak across all the, all the sites, but at least for head and neck, the once you automate some, once you it takes quite a while to sort of get everything working. But once you've automated it, um, the plans are very consistent, and they're very um, they're actually quite low MU for VMAT, and which means the apertures are quite you know, relatively large. And so they're probably more robust to, to, to MLC issues and what have you. Um, so, so I think you can design treatment approaches that are robust to, to, to some of those sort of QA issues, um, maybe in a way that's easier than if you're trying to do it by hand where you're just having to rely on different people to do the same thing. Um, but we haven't looked too much into that. That's actually a really interesting topic. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm, I'm seeing here that uh, we don't have uh, more questions. Um, once again, it was a very nice uh, presentation, very interesting. I hope you, uh, if uh, we will run another edition, uh, if you can make it, yes, I would please. appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Thanks ever so much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you.